passion skin bun makes it up at virgin active and get stronger fitter faster join now for 12 months and pay nothing until march t's and c's apply run makes, makes it up skin makes it run makes it, makes it. let's get this right sir you didn't see three men dressed as clowns take off in a van with a Renaissance painting because you were distracted by, and I quote, a sporty red compact SUV with a bold mesh grille, a sculpted bonnet with sweeping roof line on diamond cut alloys. And beautiful rear haunches. So, you saw a Jaguar E-Pace. But what about the clowns? Uh, what clowns? Jaguar E-Pace. Designed to steal attention. Search Jaguar E-Pace. At the Bank of Antandek, they've created Stan, a smart bot that can predict the future of remortgaging. I'll read Stan. Will my mortgage rate go up? 1955 was the last time Newcastle won the cup. No, I'm trying not to mumble. Playing. Let's get ready to rumble. Oh. Oh. Meanwhile, at Santander, they can't predict your future, but they'll help secure it with great mortgage rates fixed for up to 10 years. See what's possible at Santander. Early repayment charges apply. Lending subject to status and criteria. Your home may be repossessed if you do not keep up repayments on your mortgage. Whatever job you're searching for, you can find it on LinkedIn. First jobs, flexible jobs, keep me out the cold jobs. Advertising jobs, accounting jobs, HR, PR, even ER jobs. East London jobs, West London jobs, extra hour in bed jobs. Startup jobs, late start jobs, get home in the daylight jobs. Banking jobs, building jobs, flexible working on a Friday jobs. Or even voiceover jobs, which is how I ended up recording this ad. Search millions of jobs on LinkedIn and find one meant for you. To Squawk Box. Well, European investors just waking up after what turned into a rebound session in Asia. Yesterday, global investors really worrying about that virus outbreak in China and the implications uh, of that. Now, authorities in China and across the world are taking measures to try their best to contain the virus. And that seems to have eased some concern in the Asian session with Chinese stocks rebounding. Hong Kong stocks also rebounding after yesterday. That index under performed after the Moody's downgrade to the territory's credit rating. Now, just in Davos, if you were watching earlier, Stephen Jeff, we're speaking to AstraZeneca CEO. He suggested his view is that at this point, the situation is contained. Now, yesterday in Europe, we saw the stock 600 log its second negative day in a row. We saw luxury and airline stocks suffer as a result of concern around that virus spread. So it'll be interesting to see how those sectors in particular are faring this morning. We're also, of course, listening very closely to all that commentary coming out of Davos with leaders around the globe gathering in Switzerland. So taking a look at the different sectors uh, at the bottom of the board here, we've got technology, healthcare, and construction. But healthcare and technology, the only two sectors trading below the flat line in the early moments of trade. So a positive mood coming through uh, on the back of what was a positive session in Asia. Worth noting also after hours yesterday, we had Netflix and IBM report their results. Investors seem to like what they see on both those fronts, although on Netflix's side, uh, competition is heating up in the U.S., and they did feel the hit. Now, moving along, in the middle of the board, we've got financials, utilities, chemicals, and household goods. Let's take a look at what's performing best this morning. We've got media, telcos, autos, and insurance. Autos, interestingly, every every stock in that basket is trading in the green this morning. Insurance, the majority of those names are reacting positively this morning. Let's take a look at the different regions and how the regional split uh, looks this morning. In the UK, we've got the FTSE 100 bouncing about 20 20 basis points. Over in Italy, the FTSE MIB up about 10 basis points. Interesting to note that there have been reports swirling this morning in various daily newspapers in Italy around the potential stepping down of Luigi Di Maio. So we're watching very closely to see if those reports are confirmed. The DAX opening up higher as well to the tune of about four, uh, 40 basis points. So German stocks leading the way higher this morning. Well, let's uh, take a look at some of those sectors that were hit very 
very hard yesterday on the back of these concerns around the virus spread in China. And this is the airline space and the luxury space. So let me give you an update on where things stand. The World Health Organization will today hold an emergency meeting on the outbreak of the coronavirus. This as China confirmed 440 cases of the pneumonia-like illness, also raising the death toll to nine. The Chinese National Health Commission said that more than 2,000 people have been isolated. Meanwhile, America's Centers for Disease Control has announced that a first U.S. patient with the mysterious virus that reminds officials of SARS has been diagnosed north of Seattle. Now, the CDC also said that two more airports, Chicago and Atlanta, will start screening passengers. Now, as you can see here, we are seeing a bit of a bounce back in the luxury space. Airlines stabilizing, uh, for the most part, Air France KLM trading about 1% lower though. So it seems as though investors are taking a bit of comfort in the action from authorities thus far. Let's take a look at Burberry. Burberry it has raised its forecast for full year sales. The luxury a company said that higher demand for a new product line from Ricardo Tisi would help drive growth. It now expects low single digit revenue growth, but that's for the full year. But the company said Hong Kong sales for the 13 weeks ended December halved amid ongoing protests. That's a sales in Hong Kong. So obviously Burberry, as well as the broader luxury sector, very exposed to China, very exposed to Hong Kong. And interesting that we're seeing a print lower for Burberry to the tune of about 2%. Early indication from traders was that Burberry shares would actually open higher as they have raised their full year sales guidance. So this is one to watch as the morning unfolds and investors digest those latest sales numbers. Now we've got more change at the top in the supermarket space. Sainsbury CEO Mike Coop will be stepping down at the end of May after six years in his position. Coop was a driving force behind the British retailer's seven billion pound takeover attempt of Walmart owned Asda, which was of course blocked by the competition regulator. The company's current retail and operations director, Simon Roberts, will be appointed to the helm. And Sainsbury shares are trading about 1.5% lower. All right, so well, with that, let's get back Juliana. out to the guys in Davos. Thanks very much indeed for that. I just wanted to uh, reiterate this interview. The uh, U.S. President Donald Trump has lauded the U.S. economic performance during his time here in uh, uh, the World Economic Forum while decrying the profits of doom as he delivered this keynote speech. Um, do make sure you stay tuned for our U.S. colleague Joe Kernan's interview with President Trump here in Davos. Uh, we'll bring you uh, clips of that very special conversation over the next hour. So, some of the largest names in U.S. business have told CNBC they are positive about the prospects for the U.S. economy. Right now, I don't see any prospect of a recession in 2020. And I also think unemployment is going to stay low, interest rates will stay low. So, economy is pretty good. If the U.S. consumers are in good shape, that usually bodes well for the rest of the U.S. economy just because that sheer volume. And we see about $3 trillion a year of spending go through our customers' accounts. The backbone of this recovery, 11, 12 years in, has been the consumer. And when you look at what matters to the consumer, it's jobs, it's employment. We're in a spot in monetary policy where you can no longer stimulate the same way you did before. You used to push a button and go, and it would go up. With the Fed pivot, I think we've gotten uh, a revival in economic activity. We've got the trade war on hold now. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons to be positive about the economy for the next 12 months or so. But of course, here in Europe, the extended period of low rates and easy policy has business leaders keeping a more conservative outlook on the bloc's economy. The effectiveness of even looser monetary policy is losing its grip as you get closer and closer to, to, uh, to, to, to negative interest rates. You know, Barclays, we had a pretty good year in 2019. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the UK consumer is in pretty good shape, so our impairment numbers were, were, uh, were quite uh, comfortable. We grew, our, uh, we grew our, our mortgage book. Yeah, it makes it harder uh, to sail into headwinds of, of ever lower interest rates. And at some point, central bank... have to look at the health or lack there of the European banking system. There is absolutely no impact of further easing anymore. We don't see it. Actually, it's detrimental. It's detrimental to the, to the confidence of the consumers. It's detrimental to bank, banks' profits that actually have to support the economic growth. So now the pressure is going to go back onto the politicians for reform and, and fiscal easing. 
We started already in 2011 to have Japan and its investor in environment as the basic case of which we plan upon. So for us, uh, the lower for longer environment has not been coming at a surprise. Some of the biggest names in Indian finance and business have reacted to IMF concerns over the country's growth outlook during interviews here with CNBC in Davos. No, there is a concern, definitely. I won't say that there is no concern because the growth has dropped sharply. And uh, there may be a couple of reasons because in the last uh, five years, there has been a big reform agenda which the government has carried out. And when we are transitioning to a new phase, new way of doing business, I think this is the pain we are going through. If you look at 2020, India is going to grow by a percent to 5.8% next year. So it's going to be showing the fastest growth next year. And their prediction is that in 2021, India will be 6.5% ahead of China's 5.8%, which will make us once again the fastest growing economy in the world. So I guess it's one of those cases of is the glass half full or half empty. Everybody's looking at the bad news, and I think that's become a default thing. Well, let's add to those voices. Salil Parekh joins us. He is the CEO of Emphasis. Good morning to you. Uh, look, while a, a lot of your business is obviously not based in That's India, right. can I just ask for, for your comment on the IMF growth downgrade? Because it does begin to raise some questions about whether Mr. Modi is running the economy in the right direction. Well, thank you first for having me here. I think um, we, we saw what the IMF uh, projected for the growth. Uh, there's obviously been some slowing in the economy in India. Our own business, as you shared, is predominantly outside India. However, I know uh, the government, the prime minister and everyone in the business community are working towards putting in measures that are going to bring the growth back and my sense is in the next few quarters we'll start to see that. Does it have any consequences on you operationally at home when you do see uh, projections of slower growth? Uh, for, for us, uh, in fact, from a business perspective, we don't have any real implications. Uh, we have a lot of our staff which are based in India, and we see that in terms of the economic impact on individuals, but we don't see any real impact in terms of business. Just talking about the business for a moment here, um, the old traditional bread and butter IT service contract side of your operations um, must be winding down a little bit, one imagines. So could you just talk to us a little bit about what's happening in that sphere and how other parts of your operations may be compensating for that? What we're starting to see now is clients are really more focused on their digital transformation journey. And what do they mean by that? What do we mean by that? They're focused on how they leverage the cloud for their business. Uh, how do you use experience, consumer experience, individual experience to reshape technology? Or how do you use data to drive some new thinking? We see that piece of our business really growing well. Uh, we just announced our results a few days ago. Uh, that component of our business is growing at 40% year on year. And we think that's going to continue to grow at a reasonable clip. Yeah, and, and the pressures on the traditional IT services figures were there with the uh, multi-year contracts falling 5% as well. Look, I, I want to follow up on Jeff's question because I think it's the, it's the right vein to go on. Whether it be about H-1B visas, uh, whether it be about the US companies and their huge strides they're making in cloud, your amazing transformation, I say yours, your companies and the rest of the IT services industry in India, it was an amazing thing. That era is coming to an end now, and you've got to fight these guys uh, on their own turf with, with the same products now as well, because you've lost that uh, those amazing young graduates coming out of the University of Italy. They're not doing the same jobs that they would have been doing now. Is it much tougher now to provide the same kind of services with the levels, A, of competition, and B, perhaps some of the immigration borders that are being built? We're, we're certainly extremely competitive, and I think we see that in all of the change that our clients are making. From a business perspective, we've also looked to morph and change our business to really focus in on where our clients are going. Our approach has been build capabilities in where the digital future is. For example, we bought three companies last 18 months focused on digital transformation areas. One of them 
a digital studio in the UK. Can you imagine uh, we have a studio in Shoreditch, which you would never imagine. Very trendy, I'm told. Well, it is, and I'm sure you've been there <laughs> on a regular basis. Uh, we've got a studio in the US, in LA and Seattle, another company we bought. We bought a business which works on cloud services in the Nordic countries. So these are new things, different types of steps we are taking to be more current, more relevant for our clients. So we are reinventing ourselves. Will there be a global architecture stroke infrastructure? I think one of your teams got to get their phone. But but the point being uh, is that we're seeing concerns about splinter net, we're seeing about dual standards, whether it be the Chinese and walls going up uh, versus the West and vice versa as well. Is that a challenge for such an international company as yours? So today, it's certainly not something we see in our day-to-day -day business. If you look at our business, 60% comes from the US, 25% from Europe. Uh, we don't see these dual thinking yet coming into what we see. However, if it continues on, there's a possibility, and especially in the telco environment, that you see at least two sets of standards. Now, having said that, there's many ways those things could converge in time as well. So you've got to sort of wait and watch how the technology develops. You might remember years ago there was a CDMA technology before the current cell phone technology showed up. Uh, and over time things converge. And my sense is that's what will happen here. Um, you have a very good insight on which parts of the economy are demanding your services, digitalizing fast, bringing in cloud for their own customers, and which parts are lagging behind here. Um, financial services is one that we've been looking at very closely. And I'd be interested to get your read now. There has been a sense of a reluctance to spend too aggressively while their own profitability has been under pressure. Can you tell us a little bit about where you are seeing fastest uptake and perhaps some resistance? Sure. Um, and again, we shared some of this a few days ago. I'll, I'll, I'll go in a little bit more depth. We see a lot of growth in the manufacturing segment, so double-digit growth for us, very strong growth in utilities, good growth for our telco business, good growth for high-tech high business. All of these are double-digit growing businesses. Uh, where we see some softness, and we share that, was in the financial services space and in the retail space. Those are the two segments which are softer, still growing well at high single digits, but not at the double-digit level. Overall company growing at 9.5%. We actually increased our guidance here in the last quarter to go for a full-year growth of 10 to 10.5%. What we see, and you saw the banks announcing some of the results last week, phenomenal results. So again, if you're in the position of helping them make the digital change, for example, there's a lot of work that's going on today in how do you reorient retail banks where your experience when you walk in looks more and more like you're walking into Starbucks. And, and most consumers are looking for it. We're working on projects of that nature for banks in the US, banks in Europe. And that's where we see growth again. But the overall segment still has some pressures. I won't know my difference from my overdraft from my soy milk latte. That's the problem, Sanji. <laughs> I tell you, I beg pardon. Sanji, we're going to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Sanji Parekh, who is the CEO of Infosys. Well, I was just mentioning uh, one guest actually but inadvertently is coming up. Sanjeev Gupta, who is the CEO uh, and Executive Chairman of GFG Alliance. That's coming up in a very short while as well. Uh, and we'll tell you a little bit about uh, what's happening here. Make sure to stay tuned for our US colleague Joe Kernan's interview with President Trump here in Davos. We'll bring you parts of that very special conversation shortly. Start your day earlier and smarter. That pleasant breeze when you first step off the plane. The first warm <laughs> welcome from a friendly local. And that first sip of something chilled by the sun-drenched shore. Your first trip to the Algarve is rarely your last. At Sunhat Villas, we've been Algarve specialists for over 19 years. Browse our portfolio of fabulous villas and find the perfect place to stay during your next Algarve escape. Search Sun Hat Villas. Ads are protected. 
the Bank of Antander, they've created Stan, a smart bot that can predict the future of remortgaging. I'll read Stan. Will my mortgage rate go up? 1955 was the last time Newcastle won the cup. No, I'm try not to mumble. Playing. Let's get ready to rumble. Oh. Oh. Meanwhile, at Santander, they can't predict your future, but they'll help secure it with great mortgage rates fixed for up to 10 years. See what's possible at Santander. Early repayment charges apply. Lending subject to status and criteria. Your home may be repossessed if you do not keep up repayments on your mortgage. Keys. Check. Phone. Check. 70s playlist downloaded. Check. Nice. There's one more thing you should check before you leave. Your travel. There's a new cycleway under construction between Kensington Olympia and Brentford Town Centre, so expect delays due to lane closures at the junction of Kew Bridge Road and Chiswick High Road. Plan ahead at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Want to kit out your new kitchen for less? Get to B&Q. We've 20% off all kitchen sinks, taps and appliances when you spend £2,500 on a beautifully designed and affordable good home kitchen. Hurry, offer ends 2nd of February. You can do it when you are being q it. In-store orders only, maximum 10 appliances, excludes clearance, see DIY.com. Got big plans for 2020? Capture and share every highlight on a gorgeous iPhone 11 with an ultra-wide camera. In Tesco Mobile's big January sale, you can get the latest iPhone for £40.75 a month with double data. That's a mighty 20 gigs. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Ends 26th of January. Was 10 gigs, now 20 gigs. 36-month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements with Tesco Mobile required. Subject to status, phase policy applies. See tescomobile.com slash terms. You love TuneIn for live-breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on-demand news shows on TuneIn. Upgrade to TuneIn Premium and get over 45 commercial-free music stations. You'll also get live commercial-free news plus live play-by-play games from NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Uh, the U.S. and China recently signed a Phase 1 trade deal, of course. Uh, well, seen as a detent uh, in a wider trade set of tensions, our U.S. colleagues have been speaking with uh, some of the biggest names in the financial sector for their reaction to the truce. Since 1949, uh, when uh, the People's Republic was established in, in China, uh, the U.S. hasn't done a bilateral uh, uh, deal. And, and so... Um, uh, I think it's really important uh, that uh, that's occurred. These two countries together, depending upon how you do your numbers, uh, comprise 35 to 40 percent of the entire world's economy. This first phase is definitely really good for lots of American companies, the financial institutions, really good. Um, but I think from a broader macro perspective, reducing the geopolitical uncertainty around these two trade deals will have a positive impact on people's perspective on whether they spend or not. The big negative last year was that businesses were conservative during the year because they kept trying to read the uncertainty and you felt that heaviest in August coming after Labor Day. You could see that stabilized and they've been in pretty good shape and we'll have to see how they react to the, the good news of the last three, four weeks of major things getting done. This is a ceasefire. Uh, uh, hundreds of billions of tariffs are still in place. What you're really going to have is a generational systemic struggle between state capitalism and democratic capitalism. And hold, hold on to your seats because this isn't going to be solved in one mini trade deal. This is going on forever. All right. Um, we're having a fascinating conversation already off camera. We probably should share it with you lot, really. Uh, Sanjeev Gupta has joined us, who is Executive Chairman and CEO of GFG Alliance. Uh, good morning to you, sir. Good morning. Really nice to see you. Look, um, we're talking about climate, we're talking about ESG, we're talking about uh, carbon neutrality as well. A lot of focus on energy generation and oil and gas and the, the shift to renewables or how slow or fast it's been, but we don't spend enough time talking about metals and mining, which, as you just told us off camera, one of the most polluting industries on the planet. What are you doing to change that? Well, first of all, I think not a much unrecognized fact is more than 10% of emissions come from steel and aluminium. And another fact which is not that well known is that steel and aluminium consumption over the next 30 years will double. 
So 10% already in, set to double as the developing countries urbanize. So obviously, it is a massive challenge. At the same time, most of the world wants to go to legally binding carbon neutrality by 2050. So these two things are clearly at conflict. So what are you going to do? Yes. To, 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 uh, have you got some new news for us? Absolutely. So instead of taking on the 2050 challenge, we declared in October that we will make our steel industry carbon neutral by 2030. And yeah, a couple of days ago, we declared the same for our aluminium business as well. So both our steel and aluminium businesses will be carbon neutral by 2030. And we, we've explained quite heavily, or quite a lot of detail, how we will achieve that. I've spoken to people from the aggregates and cement industry, and indeed, of course, from the oil and gas industry. And every time they put a product out there that is uh, got a degree of carbon neutrality against it, uh, 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 tagged along to it, I should say, it costs more, and the consumers don't necessarily want it. Well, first of all, much of what we do doesn't cost more. So, first of all, our biggest part of our focus is on recycling which actually is cheaper than making new steel, especially in developed countries like the UK where we have mountains of steel which have accumulated since the Industrial Revolution. Did you know there's a billion tons of steel in the UK? I a had billion no tons. idea. And we only consume 10 million tons a year. Where is this billion tons of steel? In, every, in bridges, in cars, in oh. buildings. Since the Industrial Revolution, we've accumulated and amassed this mountain of steel, which is now all coming to end of life. It's all being scrapped. We already generate 10 million tons of scrap. It'll go up to 20 in the next 10 years. And we only need 10 million tons of steel. So we already have enough scrap to make all the steel we need in the UK. And if you do it with renewable energy, the carbon footprint is zero. Even if you did it with coal based energy, the carbon footprint would be a third of making new steel from uh, cooking coal in glass furnaces. So that's first relatively an easy, easy. I mean, it's a massive, massive challenge. We're building EFs globally, converting our blast furnaces globally. So that's a massive challenge. But that's a road we've already been on for quite some time. It's something we've been shouting from the top of roofs for a long time. And now, you know, the world is listening. But the balance problem, as I said, the world will double in steel consumption. That can't come from scrap because countries like India don't have scrap. They haven't got those mountains of scrap, and yet they need to urbanize, yet those populations need to prosper, and they need to consume more steel, which has to be new steel. The answer to that now is uh, hydrogen, so that's what we're focused on. The trouble here is that there's an arbitrage, isn't there? And the issue is you may make this pledge and you may achieve it either through offsetting or more efficiency or shifting energy source that you use for the smelting. But while other countries may continue to produce and don't have the same agenda, they have a cost arbitrage against you, which means they also have a price opportunity in the market. Are you uh, cutting your own throat? Yeah, absolutely. Doing this? So for example, although I won't dwell on it too much, but for example, the carbon tax uh, regime on steel in Europe is crippling. It's, it's costing European steel companies like ours uh, carbon tax, whereas you can import steel from countries which don't have the carbon tax. So that's crazy, and there is talk about a carbon border tax being adopted. But the, my bigger point is that technology will make it cheaper, same way as recycling and renewables are now cheaper. Similarly, new steel will be cheaper eventually than compared to making for carbon. Hydrogen is the answer to, the only answer actually, to making new steel versus carbon, because it does the same job. Hydrogen today is expensive, but technically it can do the same job. So our job, the industry's job, is to make hydrogen cheaper. And there's a lot of work, a lot of work everybody's doing in, in order to achieve that. As that technology gets scaled up, and as actually the only raw material it has is uh, energy, as energy gets cheaper, hydrogen will replace carbon. It will happen, it's a question of speed at which it happens, and that's a great opportunity for companies like ours to actually take leadership in that and make that happen quicker and be the first ones to do it. What about the, um, the issue of prevailing against ch cheaper Chinese manufacturers, though, because that is the elephant in the room. They are the largest emitters. Well, then you should have, you should have carbon border tax, because basically, if you're going to put a carbon tax on European steel producers, then there should be a carbon border tax on anybody who doesn't have that tax, because otherwise it's crazy. All you do is shut down your industry, and, you know, China or other countries continue to emit those emissions. Still, the same planet, just by moving the production from Europe somewhere else, doesn't solve the problem. Um, give us a view on the outlook for the industry going forward. I mean, we, we, we seem to have been in permanent decline as far as the Western world is concerned in the manufacturing of these key metals. Yes. Um, obviously, the, 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 the market has shifted to a certain extent. We've had a little bit of a weaker growth outlook from the IMF here. What impact will that have on your business for full year 2020? Well, first thing I'd like to say is that in terms of consumption of these metals, per capita, Europe, America, the Western world is still the highest in the world. Far greater, you know, if, for example, compared to India, we consume six, seven, eight times more than India does per capita. So the consumption, the market is there. So the opportunity lies in transforming our industry from the old carbon emitting industry to the new carbon neutral industry. And that in itself is a revolution, no less than the industrial revolution was or the, or the data revolution was. This new 
sustainability revolution, ecological revolution has huge opportunities for our industry to really invest and reap the benefits of that. That's number one. Number two, as you correctly say, the, ch the, the balance of consumption may be shifting. But that means that the world consumption of these metals will continue to rise. As I said, steel will double in the next 30 years. So again, there is demand there. It's just a question of working out what is the most efficient use of, of the resources to deploy them the best you can for the best return you can. Uh, it's been a pleasure catching up. Thank you for joining us. Uh, best of luck for the year ahead. Uh, Sanjeev Gupta, Executive Chairman and CEO of GFG Alliance. Um, let me just remind you, uh, I'm going to leave the set now. It says, now. it says I'm leaving the set now. Oh, really? Yeah. I'll, I'll get a bit of time off. Are you going for a bit of a gang skiing sure, or something? I might go and put my feet up for a little bit. A cup <laughs> or, of tea, or, fig roll, something I'm, like that. No, I'm looking Jam forward. butty. No way. What? You've got a big panel coming. I have got a big panel coming. Tell us about it. Shall I tell you about it? Go on. Um, we've got a panel coming up uh, here in WEF, the future of financial markets. I'll be joined by UK Chancellor Sajid Javid, the Managing Director of the IMF, Kristalina Gorgieva, US Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin, and the Chair of the board over at UBS, Axel Weber. That's 10.30 CET. <laughs> you an hour. You don't need an hour to prep for that. You no. can do it in your sleep. You're well, so good. Well, thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Uh, make sure you stay tuned uh, also. Something else. Fairly important interview, I guess. Uh, Joe Kernan. He's interviewing the president, Mr Trump, here in Davos. We're going to bring you some excerpts from that. Uh, sit down very shortly. Welcome to Nuffield Health Battersea, a gym built around you. You get regular health MOTs to create a plan that works for you, with physios and personal trainers on site. You'll find a wide range of equipment and classes, and our expert team will support you to get the most out of your health, fitness, and your membership. Join today to get the rest of the month free. Search Nuffield Health. Specialists in you. 12-month commitments only. Facilities stated are in most gyms. Visit nuffieldhealth.com forward slash terms. Keys. Check. Phone. Check. 70s playlist downloaded. Check. Nice. There's one more thing you should check before you leave. Your travel. There's a new cycleway under construction between Kensington Olympia and Brentford Town Centre. So expect delays due to lane closures at the junction of Kewbridge Road and Chiswick High Road. Plan ahead at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Hello, I'm here at the Race for Life Pretty Muddy with Great Britain's Jayanti Kaur. Jayanti, do you have a message for the millions tuned in at home? What are you talking about? Millions of people aren't tuning in to witness me doing a muddy obstacle course. Well, they absolutely should, Jayanti. You're a remarkable athlete. Uh, I'm a geography teacher. We're not athletes, we're cancer beaters. Sign up to Race for Life now and get 30% off entry until the 31st of January in partnership with Tesco. At Ring, we've reinvented the doorbell. So no matter where you are or what time of day, you can watch over your home and the things you care about. Ring Video Doorbell streams HD video and two-way talk straight to your phone so you can speak to whoever's at your door from anywhere. Delivery. Oh, great. Could you leave it with my neighbour, please? Sure, no problem. And it's so simple, you can install it yourself in minutes. See, hear and speak to whoever's at your door from wherever you are with Ring Video Doorbell. Available at ring.com and selected retailers. Ten years ago, the book The New Jim Crow helped ignite a movement against mass incarceration. This week on the New Yorker Radio Hour, I'll talk with the author, Michelle Alexander. Millions of people have been relegated to a permanent second-class status. It wasn't a message people were eager to hear, but I think it is today easier to see. Listen to this episode of the New Yorker Radio Hour on TuneIn today. to Scorebox. Uh, we're live in Davos. I'm Steve Sedgwick and these are your headlines. CNBC speaks to President Donald Trump as he dominates the conversation at the World Economic Forum following his bullish assessment of the American economy. The World Health Organization prepares to hold an emergency meeting on the outbreak of the coronavirus as the first patient is diagnosed in the United States. But the CEO of pharma giant AstraZeneca says he's not yet worried. It looks like it's contained. We have a very large presence in China. We're number one pharmaceutical company there. We employ 16,000 people. 
So as you would imagine, uh, it matters to us and we really care a lot and we monitor this. But it really looks that it is contained for the time being. Barclays CEO Jess Staley tells CNBC the effectiveness of monetary policy is losing its grip. The central banks uh, keep their accommodative stances. It makes it harder uh, to sail into headwinds of, of ever lower interest rates. And at some point, central banks across Europe have to look at the health or lack there of the European banking system. And Jeff will be discussing the future of financial markets with a star-studded WEF panel, including the U.S. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin, IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gorgieva, U.K. Chancellor Sajid Javid, and UBS's Chairman Axel Weber. Also coming up today, we speak to Renault Chairman Jean-Dominique Senard. Catch that first on CNBC interview at 10.15 CET. All right, well, we are now about a half an hour into the European trading session, and we've got green across the board here. The stock 600 up about three-tenths of a percent. This, of course, comes on the back of a rebound in Asia as investors seem to be taking comfort in the Chinese authorities' efforts to try to contain that coronavirus that sparked concern across global markets yesterday. So that positive sentiment from Asia seems to be filtering through to the European session. We've also got some corporate earnings earnings coming through that investors are digesting, but really that's affecting stocks, it seems, at a idiosyncratic level. Let's take a look at the different sectors, what the split looks like now, about a half an hour into the session. At one point, every sector was trading in the green. Now oil, oil and gas and healthcare have slipped just a touch below the flat line. The major moves higher come in autos, financial services, media, and industrials. Yesterday, luxury and airlines had come under a great deal of pressure on the back of those virus concerns. but. Uh, a bounce back coming through this morning. Let's take a look at the single stocks. A Burberry in particular, one that investors, uh, a lot of movement there this morning. Burberry shares are down about 3.6%. They came out with their Q3 trading update and saw that as sales in Hong Kong had halved over the period. So a lot of focus on Hong Kong and uh, greater China this morning uh, as we listened to the CEO and CFO give some more color. Meanwhile, the UK home builders are performing very well. Barclay as well as some of the others uh, have hit record levels this morning. So quite a strong session coming through for the UK domestic names. Steve? Excellent. Thank you very much indeed for that, Julian. Right. Uh, Italian Foreign Minister Luigi Di Maio will step down as leader of the Five Star Movement today, according to reports. Opinion polls are pointing to a defeat for the party in regional elections on Sunday. She hasn't even waited for the uh, Emilia Romagna uh, uh, vote result yet. And uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Conte, has said he will respect Di Maio's decision uh, if he stepped down. Well, look, I'm delighted to see Andrea Cabrini, who is the managing director, managing editor of Class CNBC has joined us now. Andrea, normally when things are looking bad on a vote, the leaders of a party or resign from their positions afterwards, but he's done it in advance. Yeah, timing is everything in this kind of decision, and all the sources in Rome are confirming that Di Maio will probably step down or step aside in the afternoon. He called the meeting with all the ministers of Movement Five Stars. Why is that happening? Basically, for a very long time, Di Maio has been criticized for his leadership. You know, they signed a contract with the Lega, and then they switched to Partito Democrato. They had 30% in the parliament in the last political election, and all the forecasts are very low currently. So why is now he want to anticipate the results of the Media Romani election that could be very bad, very poor for f Five Star mm. that was born in Emilia Romagna and, uh, you know, to anticipate... So it should have been a stronghold. Yeah. What, what, what I find fascinating is the commentary I've been reading from Taneo and others yeah. in advance is um, if, if these results go badly, there's a chink of light for Mr. Salvini as well. Is that the fear that we see a problem with the coalition which could lead to uh, a redux, a revival of Mr. Uh, Salvini's fortunes. Well, uh, Steve, keep in mind, every time Salvini has a victory, and Emilia-Romagna could be a historic victory because that's a stronghold of the center-left, and in addition, it has been really well managed and, and managed, and everyone says that, it could not just get 
closer and early election because you know what compact center right and left and the five star movement is fierce of going to a general election mm. so if Salvini win Emilia Romagna is he sitting as high in the polls as he was because I know that obviously in his pomp when he tried to force an election uh, and his gambit failed last year he was in the high 30s then I saw yeah. he went down to around about 30% where, where is he in opinion now in well opinion? there are no specific number you know there's a black period in Italy about you know surveys but uh, at the same the poll, yeah, yeah ahead of the vote but at the same time he's really strong in the last European election center right in Emilia Romagna was ahead of the center left so what he's been, been doing door by door square by square he's trying to transform this regional vote in a national vote in a referendum on the current government so this is what he's trying to do. So in terms of our viewers who haven't heard uh, of Emilia Romagna, which mm -hmm. sounds like a wonderful place, mm -hmm. um, Bologna is uh, part of that part of the world, is it? Yeah. This is absolutely key for the future direction of Italy this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. So on Monday morning, we will know more about the government. But what uh, the Prime Minister Conte that will be here tomorrow, he's saying, is that the government will remain stable, that even if the, they will defeat, they will suffer a lose in Emilia Romagna. There will be turbulent times ahead, but the government will not step down. Emilia Romagna is not just a stronghold of center left. It's the highest exporter and growth region in Italy. Wow. Has been very well managed. Unemployment is at historic lows. So apparently there are no reason to change the Stefano Bonaccini government in Emilia Romagna. But if this is a more national vote, things could change. Uh, thank you for joining us on set. It's I'm very brave of you to come in without a, without a jacket. I've got many layers. <laughs> yeah, you look very, 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 very Italian, very warm. It's not cold at all. <laughs> Lovely to see you, Andrea. Nice thank to see you, my friend. Steve. Thank you very much indeed. Andrea Cabrini, of course, uh, a great friend and colleague, managing editor of Class CNBC. Uh, the global economy has entered its 10th year of recovery. Uh, with investors uh, eyeing the end of the bull cycle, apparently. Speaking to CNBC, top financial executives discuss their asset allocation. The issue is you can't jump into cash. Cash is trash, okay? You have to have a well-diversified portfolio. And, and first of all, you, you have to be global, and you have to have balance. I think that you have to have a certain amount of gold in your portfolio, right? or you have to have something to target. All markets have gone up pretty dramatically, uh, you know, over the last few years. Uh, I guess the S&P is somewhere around 19 times, uh, and if you pay a premium to that, uh, that's pretty high. It's partly justified by the prospect of continued growth, partly justified, uh, you know, by the fact that interest rates are so low. We're all looking at the fact that we're um, in a 10-year recovery. Uh, we have almost record unemployment, low unemployment in the U.S. and, and in the U.K. Uh, and yet there seems no pressure from inflation. And this time last year, I think most people were expecting the central banks to raise interest rates. Uh, now, I, actually what they did was they cut interest rates. And, and I think uh, the central banks have adopted a much more accommodative monetary policy. The U.S. is taking that and driving a fiscal stimulus policy. And I think you'll start to see other countries like the UK begin to do that. And that's providing a certain floor, I think, to the economy, which is lending itself to more optimism. So you've seen from some US financial institutions, and indeed there you can just see the final one, uh, Jez Staley as well. And look, it's amazing. And I, I want to just preface uh, our conversation with the next guest saying there isn't a, a European banker who we've had on set who hasn't talked primarily about these concerns about negative rates. And I know it's going to be the same story now. Uh, Herbert Scheid has joined us, who's the chairman of Fontebel, uh, also the chair of the Swiss Bankers Association. Really good morning to you, sir. Good morning to you. Look, it's almost as if these amazingly smart gentlemen, and I'm afraid they are gentlemen to a man, and we, we would like to see more women on set as well, but have, have had almost a coordinated action, whether it's Ralph Harmers, Jess Stay, um, the CEOs of Intesa, the CEOs of ABN Am you name we've spoken to everybody. They're all saying negative rates are a massive problem to profitability going forward. It's almost as if there's a coordinated message from you all for Madame Lagarde. Well, it's not coordinated, but I mean, when you look at it, you know, it was fine to introduce very low interest rates 10 years ago, but being 10 year in crisis mode, even though the economy is doing well, as we see, or relatively well, um, is, is, is wrong. And negative interest rates, as we have in Europe and in Switzerland, really turns the world upside down. And it's not about... Uh, 
only about the profits of a bank. It's about the overall societal consequences. And, you know, the pension funds uh, have a hard time to um, create returns for the pensioners. The, saving, uh, the savers and the retail investors, they basically have no return. So, so the negative consequences are really big and will catch up with the whole society. Well, this is what I want to talk about because this isn't new that bankers dislike negative rates as well, that it's affecting their net interest margins. In fact, one of the conversations I still remember most graphically was Jeff on a panel of, uh, two or three years ago with Axel Weber, I think it was three now, mm. saying the, the, the medicine could kill the patient if we're not careful. Words on that bet. The, the ramifications from this medicine could be, well, catastrophic potentially. What are the ramifications? You mentioned pension funds, you mentioned savers, and of course, aging demographics is going to really come home to buy, but do you fear that it could be worse than a benign scenario? It could be really catastrophic for Europe. Um, it is. I mean, if you look at the um, U.S. banks and the European banks, you see the big difference in part of the difference in profitability. Roads, roads, and any measure, it's ridiculous. And, yeah. Yes, and and you know, you do create. Uh, bubbles, asset bubbles. We see that in the real estate market and not just in Switzerland. We see it all over in Europe. So we have negative interest rates and we have measures against negative interest rates, uh, such as uh, you know, measures against you know, creating bubbles. Uh, you, have, you have zombie firms developing. We know that about 10% of companies in Europe, particularly in Southern Europe, would not be able to exist without negative interest rates. So you, we are ten percent. We are so we are creating a kind of zombie economy, and I think that needs to be addressed. Um, but that's presumably been done. Damage has been done. I mean, I look at uh, the debt levels from Tim Adams's IIF as well, and the well, I think it was two hundred fifty-three trillion, three hundred twenty-two percent debt to GDP on the global basis. Uh, this is going to be exacerbated in Europe, isn't it? Yes. I mean, if you look overall, I mean, Greece can now take out debt. At, and is paid to the tune of 30 basis points. Just remind points. me, this is Greece that already has 180% debt to GDP. Absolutely. Right. And, you know, there is an incentive to increase debt. And, and uh, we already have, I mean, the overall global debt level is at 80% of global GDP. So, you know, if you transfer that to a normal household, um, you would say, can I afford to have 80% of what I make? Uh, in terms of debt, and it is not it is not sustainable. But I mean, I see no appetite for extensive fiscal expansion from the countries that have money. I see a clamour for the country from the countries that don't have it. But dare I say, Northern Europe, um, Switzerland isn't in the EU, but I mean, closely aligned as we've seen with the SMB as well, Germany, uh, the Netherlands. We've just been hearing as well. These countries haven't got an appetite for fiscal expansion, have they? No, I think no. Government has an appetite to do anything at the moment because well, have you the, seen the Brits. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we, yes, yes, but I mean the central banks step in, and yeah. at every moment when the economy is sort of is slowing down, they sort of they they they, they sort of um, lose monetary, monetary policy. Mm -hmm. So that relieves all governments of taking the necessary structural yeah. reforms, Which is and, that, and, and that, that 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 is the real real mm -hmm. danger. Let me change subject size. We've got one more question, I think, with you as well. Um, Switzerland, provider of financial services, legendary financial service. What have you done since, you know, I think you've been chair of Fontebel since 2011 as well. How is Switzerland transforming its USP? It's a horrible acronym, but it's unique selling proposition for the world in advertising what is great about Swiss banks. Well, I think, you know, to the tune of the topic of, of the WEF, um, Swiss, Swiss banks have started about 30 years ago to, um, to develop sustainable investment products. Switzerland, you know, has an incredible leverage with all the assets under management we look after here um, to, to offer sustainable products. And, and um, my bank, um, we have been active in that field for at least 15 years. Um, well, it takes two to tango. You need clients. We are looking after clients, money. So we need to convince uh, our clients to invest they in need those convincing. products. I thought the clients were giving the push now. Do they? Uh, well, the push for the institutions to make those investments. Um, it's very ambiguous. Um, you know, when you sort of offer it, you need to explain that returns, good returns, and sustainable investment go hand in hand. They are not in contradiction. So a very important thing. I think that's an important contribution Swiss banks can make to the whole overall 
uh, uh, sustainable investment. Yeah, but really lovely to see you. Thank you very much, Dave. So not coordinated, but a very consistent message for Madame Lagarde as well. <laughs> okay. uh, and of course, of course, for the SMB as well. Herbert Scheid, thank you very much indeed. Chair of Vontabel and also the chair of the Swiss Bankers Association. Well, look, we've got plenty more guests coming up, of course, on the channel, including Takeshi Ninami, who is the CEO of Suntory Holdings. What do you mean you don't know Suntory? Well, Suntory is one of the biggest beverage companies on the planet. Jim Beam, uh, plus a whole host of consumer products uh, that are non-alcoholic as well. We will discuss after a short break and make sure you tune in to our colleague, US, uh, US colleague Joe Kerner. He's got an interview that you might be interested in. It's the president, Mr. Trump, coming up here in Davos. We'll bring you excerpts uh, of that sit-down very shortly. Right now on CNBC Make It, can giving up coffee... Take the helm and ignite your spirit of adventure with a Sunsail holiday. Relax on a skippered yacht from sunny St. Lucia to the nutmeg-scented shores of Grenada. Or take charge with a bareboat charter along Dubrovnik's glittering coastline. With up to 20% off selected destinations, now is the time to book your Sunsail adventure. Sunsail. See the world differently. Whatever job you're searching for, you can find it on LinkedIn. First jobs, flexible jobs, keep me out the cold jobs, advertising jobs, accounting jobs, HR, PR, even ER jobs, East London jobs, West London jobs, extra hour in bed jobs, startup jobs, late start jobs, get home in the daylight jobs, banking jobs, building jobs, flexible working on a Friday jobs, or even voiceover jobs, which is how I ended up recording this ad. Search millions of jobs on LinkedIn and find one meant for you. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip, run. Give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time, skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up. Add a boxing class, skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing until March. T's and C's apply. Run. Mix, mix it up. Skin. Mix it Run. Mix it, mix it. Hey, NFL fan. Can't watch the game? Can't be there? No biggie. Hot. With your TuneIn Premium membership, you already have an all-access pass to every team and every game in the league. Amazing, right? Steps up, floats it towards At the goal line, it's intercepted! Listen live as the action unfolds, or on demand when you can. Anytime, anywhere, all season long. Right side, it is caught. It is in for the right side for the touchdown. Again. Search NFL today. Like what you're listening to? Want to make getting back to it easier? Use the favorite button to keep track of the stations and podcasts you love on TuneIn. Just tap or click the heart icon to add it to your favorites. Then find all your go-to audio under the favorites tab. Pretty easy, right? The puck drops. 12 players face off to win. The suspense is pure torture, but you wouldn't miss this for the world. TuneIn brings you every minute of the NHL season. Listen live to hockey when it matters most on TuneIn. Welcome back to Scorebox. In addition to President Trump, one of the other headline acts of the World Economic Forum yesterday was... Uh, 17-year-old activist Greta Thunberg. Uh, she warned delegates that time was running out to address dangerous emissions levels. The teenager also blasted leaders for letting party politics affect climate change policies. I've been warned that telling people to panic about the climate crisis is a very dangerous thing to do. But don't worry, it's fine. Trust me, I've done this before and I can assure you it doesn't lead to anything. And, and for the record, when we children tell you to panic, we're not telling you to go on like before. Well, I'm absolutely delighted to say that I've got Takeshi Ninami, who is the president and CEO of Suntory Holdings, joining us on set as well. Really nice to meet you, sir, nice as well. Look, you. Um, you can give us an amazing lens into the beverage industry and the pref 
pressures you're you're finding uh, from environmentalists, from climate change activists to to switch from plastic as well. But I, as from my conversation off air with you already, it's a lot more nuanced than just switching from plastic to a and other beverage uh, packaging source. Well, first of all, uh, we should reduce the plastics as much as uh, we can. Having said that, uh, you know, reducing and uh, replacing to other materials, if any. Mm. And considering safety, considering its convenience, considering cost-wise, the best way is to uh, recycle uh, PET bottles. I talk about uh, only PET bottles because we are a beverage company. Mm. And uh, we are working on uh, recycling quite a lot, working with the uh, consumers and the government. Mm. And in Japan, for example, we collect 80% of the PET bottles. And out of that, we recycle the uh, PET bottle, collect it to a uh, recycled bottle. So this is uh, the uh, uh, industry accord among all the computers in Japan. And plus the te technology. First of all, we uh, use the uh, huge amount of, uh, used to use, used to use a huge amount of PET for a bottle. Now very thin. Yeah. That needed technology. And plus, we use the uh, 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 technology to recycle with the far less carbon footprint. So it comes to the PET model, we have to talk about uh, how much we are using a carbon footprint, and we have to decrease as much as we can. Is it possible for your industry to find some form of carbon neutrality? I think we can do that. And uh, plus, in addition to that, definitely, uh, we have to increase uh, 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 recycling, and plus we have to advance technology mm. so that we can reduce uh, our carbon footprint in the process of recycling. And in addition, we have to plant more trees, and uh, sure. we have to Well, work even on the that. President of the United States talked about joining the Trillion Tree Project yesterday. It's a great so, thing. Well, that and was... We that, are doing I think so. that was his one nod to the environmentalists. Yeah. I don't think there was much else in there as well. Yeah. But, but in terms of... If I may just change tack, because you've only got a couple of minutes as well. Um, negative interest rates, um, low JGB yields. I mean, the, the experiment perhaps started off by uh, Karodasan has been expanded around the world as well. Is it working, or is it just encouraging companies to go out and make rash acquisitions? Well, first of all, it's been uh, um, successful in Japan, so that the, the Japanese consumers regain certain level of trust. It hasn't got the inflation level, sir. Well, underlining still infl deflation mind is still going on, but uh, it's been better. And uh, the current growth rate is over 1%. Mm. Uh, you know, take a look at the eight years ago. That was a negative 1%. Mm. Having said that, further negative interest uh, will work or not. It's a question. Yeah. And uh, we need maybe fiscal policy more, uh, using the, uh, some instruments, uh, equipment, uh, so forth. But a key thing is uh, um, private sector's investment. Mm. Because a lot of money is sleeping in banks. And there's a lot of money sleeping everywhere. That's what I probably encourage you to make a $16 billion acquisition of Beam as well. Um, Financing was incredibly cheap for that, I'm sure, as well. You could leverage up extraordinarily on that as well. Are there more big acquisitions to come in the States and elsewhere? Not really, but uh, we want to acquire some brands, mm. not only um, uh, whiskey, spirits, business, but also soft drink, maybe nutritional products where we have the uh, strength. So cheap money means a lot, but uh, it should be going to the real business instead of the kind of, you know, a bubble business, and uh, I, I doubt the uh, the uh, sustainability of the uh, I, you know techie business. And you worried about valuations? No. Uh, well, I think our business. I think currently the evaluation of spirits business is getting better and better. Yeah. So that means there is an entry barrier in our spirits business. So we have a huge advantage. Really lovely to see you, sir. Nice Good to, to get, a, get a gauge on your business and what you're up to as well. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank and you Takeshi Ninami, who is the president and CEO of Suntory Holdings. Well, uh, as well as eminent uh, businessmen, we've also got one or two other political interviews. You might be interested in the fact that Joe Kernan is going to be speaking, or has been speaking, with President Trump here in Davos. We'll bring you some excerpts of that. Sit down very shortly.
people treat their finances like their health. Welcome to Nuffield Health Battersea, a gym built around you. You get regular health MOTs to create a plan that works for you, with physios and personal trainers on site. You'll find a wide range of equipment and classes, and our expert team will support you to get the most out of your health, fitness, and your membership. Join today to get the rest of the month free. Search Nuffield Health. Specialists in you. 12-month commitments only. Facilities stated are in most gyms. Visit nuffieldhealth.com forward slash terms. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. 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 Mix it up. Skip. Run. Skip. Run. Give yourself a lift. Mix, mix it up. Lift. Mix it up. Run. Lift. Splash. Skip. Lift. Run. It's crunch time. Skip. Mix, mix it up. Run. Mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip. Run. Splash. Skip. Run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing until March. T's and C's apply. Run. Mix, mix it up. Skip. Mix it Run. Mix it Whatever job you're searching for, you can find it on LinkedIn. First jobs, flexible jobs, keep me out the cold jobs, advertising jobs, accounting jobs, HR, PR, even ER jobs, East London jobs, West London jobs, extra hour in bed jobs, startup jobs, late start jobs, get home in the daylight jobs, banking jobs, building jobs, flexible working on a Friday jobs, or even voiceover jobs, which is how I ended up recording this ad. Search millions of jobs on LinkedIn and find one meant for you. I used to be a bit of a rubbish sleeper. I'd toss and turn all night. And somehow, I could never find the comfy bit of the mattress. <laughs> it was a proper nightmare. That's what brought me here. Testing mattresses in the Witch Test Lab. We use a custom-made barrel rolling machine to simulate a decade's worth of use. And the mattresses that perform best are the only ones we recommend for your bedroom. Which tests harder so you can buy smarter. Visit witch.co.uk. Keys. Check. Phone. Check. 70s playlist downloaded. Check. Nice. There's one more thing you should check before you leave. Your travel. There's a new cycleway under construction between Kensington Olympia and Brentford Town Centre. So expect delays due to lane closures at the junction of Kewbridge Road and Chiswick High Road. Plan ahead at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. At Ring, we've reinvented the doorbell. So no matter where you are, or what time of day, you can watch over your home and the things you care about. Ring Video Doorbell streams HD video and two-way talk straight to your phone, so you can speak to whoever's at your door from anywhere. Delivery. Oh, great. Could you leave it with my neighbour, please? Sure, no problem. And it's so simple, you can install it yourself in minutes. See, hear and speak to whoever's at your door from wherever you are with Ring Video Doorbell. Available at ring.com and selected retailers. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. Good morning and welcome to Street Science. We are live from Davos and I'm Jemana Versace. Hi, Jemana. Hello, everybody. I'm Maddie Drury in London and these are your headlines. CNBC speaks to President Donald Trump as he dominates the conversation at the World Economic Forum following his bullish assessment of the American economy. The World Health Organization prepares to hold an emergency meeting on the outbreak of the coronavirus as the first patient is diagnosed in the United States. But the CEO of Pharma Died AstraZeneca says he is not worried yet. It looks like it's contained. We have a very large presence in China. We are number one pharmaceutical company there. We employ 16,000 people. So as you would imagine, it matters to us and we really care a lot and we monitor this. But it really looks that it is contained for the time being. Barclays CEO Jess Staley tells CNBC the effectiveness of monetary policy is losing its grip as central banks keep their accommodative stances. 
it makes it harder uh, to sail into headwinds of, of ever lower interest rates. And at some point, central banks across Europe have to look at the health or lack thereof of the European banking system. And Jeff discusses the future of financial markets with a star-studded WEF panel featuring U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva, U.K. Chancellor Sajid Javid and UBS Chairman Axel Weber. A lot of stars indeed, Germano. And also coming up today, we speak to Renault Chairman Jean-Dominique Senard. Catch that first on CNBC interview at 10.15 CET. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Street Signs. We are live from the World Economic Forum in Davos. Now, U.S. President Donald Trump lauded the U.S. economic performance during his time in the job while decrying the prophets of doom as he delivered a keynote speech at the World Economic Forum. Make sure to stay tuned for our U.S. colleague Joe Kernan's interview with President Trump here in Davos. We will bring you excerpts of that very special conversation in just a few moments. Now, the U.S. Treasury Secretary will join Jeff on stage for a panel he is moderating on the future of financial markets. The other speakers are IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva, U.K. Chancellor Sajid Javid, and UBS Chairman Axel Weber. That is all coming up at 10.30 CET as well. Now, our top story today, the World Health Organization will today hold an emergency meeting on the outbreak of the coronavirus. This as China confirmed 440 cases of the pneumonia-like illness, also raising the death toll to nine. The Chinese National Health Commission said that more than 2,000 people have been isolated. Meanwhile, America's Centers for Disease Control has announced that a first U.S. patient with the mysterious virus that reminds officials of SARS has been diagnosed north of Seattle. The CDC also said that two more airports, Chicago and Atlanta, will start screening passengers. And climate is at the forefront here in Davos, with President Trump and activist Greta Thunberg trading veiled attacks in key speeches yesterday. Our next guest has called for more coordinated action from businesses to address the challenge. I'm very happy to say that Christian Mamotela, the CEO of Cicery, joins me uh, live on the set of Davos. Thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. You know, I want to talk about the economic cost of climate change because looking at last year was yet another very, very costly year for the industry, for the insurance industry. Natural and man-made disasters caused economic losses of around $140 billion. Let's start with Cicery as a firm. How have you fared? Yeah, of course, our purpose in society is to make society more resilient. So it is our job to uh, help families after this event to recover. Uh, and we have done that for a very long time. Now, 2017 has been the costliest year ever. Uh, 2018, the fourth costliest year. 19 was a bit more normal, but generally we have seen an increase in, in losses, uh, mostly also in, in bushfires, in, in droughts, in, in floods. Uh, and so we have to adapt uh, prices, right? And we have to talk about it uh, to the world. But, you know, how many of these natural disasters were actually covered by insurance? Because that's a big question for the industry as well. I mean, for you guys, it must be potentially an opportunity if you think about it in the future. Yeah, so our job is to uh, take out volatility, but climate change is really a trend. So mm -hmm. things are getting worse, and you cannot insure a trend because it's a certainty. There's nothing to be insured. So it's really something that will be borne by societies, and therefore for, for a very long time we have been warning around that trend because we, we clearly see it in the, in the data. Uh, now, uh, typically about half of the natural catastrophes, the, uh, half of the economic loss is covered by insurance. It depends on countries. Some countries like the U.S. is probably half. Some countries much less, right? Obviously, the poor countries are less uh, less covered. So that's another issue, right? This what we call protection gap, which we try, you know, passionately to, to cover and, and, and penetrate right, over time. Are prices going up, though, to reflect the increased amount of uh, risk in this domain? Are you being able to pass those pricing, uh, higher pricing through? Yeah, so we, we see a change now, right? The people were skeptic for a very a long time. Uh, on the scientific front, there's less certainty around hurricanes, but there's a, a lot of, uh, there's actually consensus in the scientific field that we see more drought, we have more uh, hail, uh, we, we have more floods, etc. So uh, we're in the process of passing this on. These are yearly renewable contracts, and so pricing is adapted from a year to another. 
And I see you're also getting involved in some niche areas. Uh, just recently, you were involved in the issuance of a parametric catastrophe bond, which I thought was quite interesting because it covers specifically against the mortgage risk caused by earthquakes. Uh, so very niche, but presumably also higher margin business for you. Well, I mean, this, this, um, this is really important. Right? People don't realize in, in the U.S., uh, a lot of people are not insured. In California, maybe 12% of households are insured against earthquake, and it's an earthquake region. Uh, what happens in the case of a big earthquake in the U.S., you basically, as a, as a whole, uh, if you own a house, you give the key back to the banks. So the banks have these huge risks of, of earthquake and natural catastrophes. And we have been talking to a lot of them uh, in the past years, but only now that they start to realize in their integrated risk management how big that risk is, and that there might be indeed an opportunity, right, for the insurance and reinsurance industry at large. Uh, but I guess what motivates us is more that people can recover after a big loss, right? That's, that's really what we're in for. I want to turn and talk a little bit about the asset side of your portfolio. Um, I see you, as uh, Swiss Re, has joined other asset managers to launch the UN Convened Net Zero Assets Owner Alliance. Effectively, what that means is you've committed to a carbon neutral investment portfolio by 2050. Um, how does that actually affect your portfolio? Like, talk me through the mechanics here. Are you going yes. to be not investing in the future in high carbon industries, or are you going to be selling down your existing portfolio? So this is a big challenge for a lot of uh, CEOs. What can we do, right? Because there's nothing perfect yet. There's no who defines what is green, what is not green, what to do. So what we've decided is we shifted in 2017 the whole portfolio, more than 100 billion US dollars, to an ESG benchmark. It's the Barclays Bloomberg Index. And what it does is you stay invested in every industry. So you do that, also the more polluting industries. But they have a, a rating for all players in that industry. And you can set a cutoff. You can say, I only invest in the, the, the most positive half of those. Those players, so encouraging uh, the good actors. So it's, it's not perfect, but it's the best thing we could find. We shifted the whole portfolio, and since then, actually, has outperformed uh, the old uh, portfolio. So it's not like you have less returns. Mm, so there's maybe commercial incentive there as well. Christian, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for taking the time to chat to us today on Street Science, very special edition today in Davos. Christian Momentaler, the uh, CEO of Swiss Re. Now, uh, U.S. President Donald Trump lauded the U.S. economic performance during his time in the job while decrying the profits of doom as he delivered a keynote speech at the World Economic Forum. Make sure to stay tuned for our U.S. colleague Joe Kernan's interview with President Trump here in Davos. We'll bring you excerpts of that very special interview in a few moments as well. And the U.S. Treasury Secretary will join Jeff on stage for a panel he's moderating on the future financial markets. The other speakers are IMF Managing Director Kristina Georgieva, U.K. Chancellor Sajid Javid, and UBS Chairman Axel Weber. That's also coming up at 10.30 CET. And in company news, Daimler has warned that pre-tax earnings will slump to 5.6 billion euros in 2019 in its third profit warning for the year. The German car maker said it was hit by higher legal costs stemming from its Mercedes-Benz diesel vehicles. It added that these expenses will impact its core Mercedes-Benz cars with the unit's return on sales to dip by 4%. And you can see the stock is down about 1% this morning. And Renault chairman Jean-Dominique Senard says there is a real desire to make the French car maker's alliance with Nissan succeed. He has dismissed reports of ongoing issues in the partnership. And the very man himself is sitting right next to me here in Davos, Jean-Dominique Senard, the chairman of Renault. It's a pleasure to have you with us Thank you very much. on the show. I, look, I want to start off and, and talk about the stock performance of Renault in 2019. It was a very, very tricky year. Can I just ask you, how much of that do you think you can put down to just the external environment, trade, trade war, the manufacturing slump, uh, decline in demand versus ongoing issues at the helm and management at Renault due to the departure of Carlos Ghosn? Honestly, I think there's a large part of that uh, linked to the circumstances in the market and, uh, and, and the perspective that the automotive industry is in facing huge challenges. I mean, uh, all the markets, as you know very well, are always anticipating issues. But I think uh, this may someday reverse because um, questions about the alliance, uh, you know, um, what are the new challenges, how are we going to get out of that situation, were in every mind. And I can understand that. Yeah. But the good news, and that's what I want to insist on, is that we are now in a new stage of the alliance. Probably back to the 
spirit of the alliance when it was created 20 years ago, which was a success. Um, and I think we're now uh, shaping up the whole thing in a way that we can only have positive news in the coming future. And I, I really mean it because managements have changed. The spirit about the alliance is totally different than right. what it was a few months ago. It needs time, of course, to go through the, the public opinion and, 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 how, and observers. How is the relationship right now with Nissan? That's what people well, want to know. Well, the, well, I'm telling you, it's extraordinarily positive. I mean, I, we're speaking every day to the management of Nissan. Uh, there is a fluid relationship. I have never lived that uh, in the past year. And t we're having a, a monthly meeting with the uh, Alliance Operating Board, which is a very, very efficient board. Um, we are meeting in Tokyo next week. We will discuss. You will see in 2020 a lot of news, news flow about positive actions of this alliance. I promise it's going to happen, and the people are there. To, to Talk to me about the economics, though, because fundamentally the issue that Nissan has had with this alliance, and this is long-standing, mm. going back to 2015, long before Some your time, story, yeah. is, that, is that they're a junior partner in this alliance. They don't have voting rights. And yeah. this has been a sticky issue for a very, very long time. You, Do you think there's scope for a reworking of that economic framework? Yes, I always mention that nothing is fixed for eternity, you know, and uh, but the, the priority today is to make sure that this alliance works well on the industrial part, because that's the key, and that's what we're doing. And to tell you the truth, uh, we don't have this uh, shareholder issue in mind when we talk together today about what needs to be done mm. urgently. Uh, if one day in the future things are resettled or rebalanced, why not? But it's not the priority today, I, I really mean it. This is not at the center of the discussions as we speak. We have urgent matters to settle. We have the Nissan recovery. We have the Renault strengthening. And the good news is that we all know today that the alliance is absolutely central for that and that we, the alliance will be uh, at, 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 at the heart of the revival of the different companies. Well, one one plausible solution, and this is not me saying this, but you know, some right. analysts out there on the streets say, look, Renault has an operating cash flow problem. Would it not make sense to sell down some of your stake in Nissan, get some of the cash flow, rebalance the relationship right. with Nissan? So you're taking two boxes in one go. Yeah, but you know, uh, there are circumstances for that where it's uh, easy to do, some where it's not. Today is probably, I mean, for obvious reasons, not the right timing yeah. in terms of uh, the price of the shares. And, yeah. and again, it's something that can come someday, why not? But it's not the priority. It has to happen, it has to make sense. To tell you the truth, today it's not a problem between ourselves because we have, you know, priority issues to settle and we are working on that and you will see signals about that in the coming months. I think uh, there is a time for everything. We need to cool things down. I think that's it. Last year was a year where, you know, there was some sort of uh, views that this alliance was having frictions, people were not working well together, etc. Okay. You remember all that. This is now behind us. Okay. I mean, it's very important to understand that we are not at all in the same spirit. So having said that, when we demonstrate this year that this alliance is absolutely the future for our companies, we can always uh, you know, speak about other issues, but they will come behind. And, and I think that's very important. Okay, that, that's very clear. Um, I want to take you to something that outgoing Chief Carlos Ghosn said in his press conference. Uh, one of the things that he said, and he bemoaned the fact that Renault missed the boat on the Fiat Chrysler deal. Do you think that they indeed missed an opportunity there? Well, you know, everybody is free to have uh, comments, and I will certainly not comment the comments. But uh, what I say is that this project was a good one. Uh, I have supported it at uh, the time, and I felt it was good for Renault. It was good for the alliance. So I've said what I had to say on that. Circumstances have made it uh, otherwise. Well, I'm not going to live with regrets all my life, you know. It's, uh, it's not my view, and that's the way I, I manage uh, the, the, the prospects. And I think everybody understands that the key now is to concentrate on this alliance, which is unique in the world. I can tell you, I've, I'm t the potential of this alliance is huge. Um, I publicly said, I think at some point, that 80% of the potential of this alliance is in front of us, it's not mm. behind. And that is our duty now to extract that potential. Synergies are big in front of us. We need to measure them accordingly, appropriately, and to have them 
done. But just to bring it back to FCA, obviously that would have given you some geographic exposure to the United States, right. to North America, where you don't really have a presence mm. right now. Right. Are you on the hunt for other potential deals or partnerships? You know, this geographical aspect is one thing, but it already exists in the alliance. You see, if the alliance is strong, which I think it is, and it's going to show that, the American exposure is there. Uh, Nissan is exposed in, in North America, as you know very well know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so we have this complementary geographical footprint, which is absolutely extraordinary when you think of it. Europe, Japan, China, North America, South America, we're everywhere. The question for us today is to strengthen that. It's the top priority. And tell you what, once the markets will realize that what I say is real and happens, then this alliance, which is unique in the world, will become very attractive. So we're not hunting, you know, because we have so many other things to do. But I guess that in the future, people will try hunting to get in the alliance to strengthen it. And then that, that, we will see a reverse That's potentially situation. one way it could well, play out. Well, and again, I, I just I want to take you back again yeah, to please. the geographic exposure right, to North right, America and the right. fact that you don't have a lot of it right now. Well, um, you're probably actually thinking that's a good thing because um, one of the other big potential uh, threats that could be facing the auto industry in Europe this year is that of tariffs. And indeed, you know, President Trump is here right. in Davos. Right. Uh, we don't know how the discussions are going to evolve. It seems like both parties for the time being have cooled down but we don't know whether or not the U.S. may come back in and impose yeah. tariffs on the auto right. industry. Renault must be better positioned from that perspective than some of the German automakers. Well, in that sense, you're right. But, I mean, if you, if you sort of have a backseat on all that, what we need is now certainty. Uh, we all hate uncertainty, of course, and I think in that respect, uh, when it comes to the automotive industry, there is a quite significant and sensitive issue. Um, hopefully in 2020, um, everybody will go back to reason and that we will uh, sort of have a smooth outcome of all these discussions. How can I say more? Um, things are not in our hands. We just have to witness the fact that for the global economy, in North America, like in Europe, if the automotive industry is uh, sound, well, it will be sound for our countries. I mean, we have to understand that the automotive industry is a solution for the future, not a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, we better think uh, twice before hitting on the head of the automotive industry and uh, creating barriers for its development. We have a huge avenue in front of us to show that this industry is probably one of the leaders in the uh, I would say, the environmental friendly uh, environment in the future. Honestly, uh, we, we have a huge card in front of us, so let's make sure that we have not too, not too many constraints to develop, because we have wonderful projects, and it will be good for the United States, it will be good for Europe. Just on that topic, and you say, you know, the future of autos uh, obviously mm. can be quite beneficial, especially, I'm, I believe you're referring to electric vehicles here. Of course, yeah. We have Literally. new auto emission standards coming due right. this year, which right. puts a lot of pressure on car makers uh, to get to those standards. Essentially, you have to sell a lot more electric vehicles. Are you confident you can? Well, the, when I look at the, uh, the, the, the trend, it's incredibly positive. Uh, we're talking about uh, plus 35 or plus 40 percent. I mean, okay, on the, the basis is small, but the, the increase is, is, is dramatically strong. The, the hope we have here is that um, the consumers will now understand that uh, by sitting in a Renault Zoe, uh, the customer can travel almost uh, 380 kilometers without any problems, and so that the psychological barrier is now dropping. Mm -hmm. Once that's done, with all the hybrids that are coming along, etc., I'm absolutely sure that the consumer will, will have. The problem we have is that we have to, to strengthen the relationship between the public area and the private area so that the infrastructures uh, are really available. That's the key, because once we have it, I think that the trend is absolutely one way.
All right, so I'm going to leave it there. Just actually one question, final quick one for you. Please. Will we get uh, the name of the new CEO by the end of this week? We're all sitting here waiting. <laughs> well, it will be short, certainly, in a short period of time. In a short don't, period don't of time. Don't ask me the day. But I, will, okay, uh, I won't ask you the day. Exactly. John Dominique Senar, the chairman of Renault, thank you very much, thank you so much. for your time thank today you. Thank you. in Davos. Uh, that was the chairman of Renault talking us through uh, the future of the alliance and uh, very positive on the outlook. Now, U.S. President Donald Trump has been the main act here at the World Economic Forum. The American leader sat down with our colleague Joe Kernan this morning and outlined his view on trade negotiations with the EU and the U.K. Is the U.K. next with Boris Johnson? Yeah, well, Boris and I are friends, and he wants to make a deal, and that's okay with me. So that I think could they start, want it. They need it. That could start soon? Oh, yeah, we're starting. We've already started negotiating, and frankly, we're starting with Europe, too. Europe is... To be honest with you, Europe has been very, very tough to deal with. They've taken advantage of our country, the European Union, for many, many years. And I told them, we can't do it anymore. I met with them yesterday. I wanted to wait till they finished China, to be honest with you. I always like to be very transparent. I wanted to wait till I finished China. I didn't want to go with China and Europe at the same time. Now China is done. And I met with the new head of the European Commission, who's terrific. Mm -hmm. And we had a great talk, but I said, look, if we don't get something, I'm going to have to take action. And the action will be a very high tariffs on their cars and other things that come into our country. Now, saying that, I don't want your audience to get nervous. They're going to make a deal because they have to. They have to. They have no choice. But we've had a tremendous deficit for many, many years, over $150 billion with Europe. And they are, frankly, Jean-Claude was a friend of mine, but he was impossible to deal with. And I think it's going to be a lot better for Boris now, too. You couldn't make a deal. It was very hard to make a deal. Now, I never played my cards because I didn't want to do that again while I was doing China. I wanted to do China first. I wanted to do Mexico and Canada first. But now they're all done. And now what we do is we are going to do Europe. And I had a very good conversation. And I would be very surprised if I had to implement the tariffs. Joe also asked him about the drivers behind his uh, optimistic view, uh, ass assessment of America's growth rate and how the Fed has impacted the economy. It will be higher than 2%. A lot of people are very thrilled with that. Me, I'm not, but we had a lot of bad things happen. Number one, the Fed was not good, okay. as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and that was a big blip that should not have taken place. It should not have happened, but it's one of those things. But we have Boeing. We yes. had the big strike with General Motors. We had things happen that are very unusual to happen, including some unbelievably powerful storms. You know, we were hit with sure. storms. Now, with all of that, had we not done the big raise on interest, I think we would have been close to four. And I, I could see 5,000 to 10,000 points more on the Dow. But that was a killer when they raised the rate. It was just a big mistake. And they admit to it. They admit to it. I was right. I don't want to be right, but I was right. Well, our very own Steve Sedgwick joins me on set. Such a pleasure to be with you here yeah, at Davos. Yeah, it's been uh, a whole yeah. 23 minutes I haven't been on set, so uh, enjoying <laughs> coming no, back and seeing That's for the wicked, very, very wicked, Steve. Yeah. So look, uh, what a fascinating yeah. 24 hours. What a mm. fascinating afternoon we saw yesterday where uh, Greta Thunberg uh, and Mr. Trump both actually, which was extraordinary, not naming each other by name, but just going for it uh, on, the, on the, the aggression towards the other side of the camp on the climate change. And then, of course, uh, Joe's interview regarding the economy and um, what was a shopping list yesterday. I don't know if you actually heard yeah. Mr. Trump speaking yesterday, because I know you were coming up the mountain, mm. but, but the shopping list of achievements he, he touted under his presidency. Yeah, and I mean, it was interesting. I mean, to be fair, the U.S. economy has been strong. Um, it, I think it came as a bit of a surprise that he would give that type of uh, address to an international audience. Remember, most of the U.S. audience were asleep at that time. And the focus of the talk was very much on the U.S. economy and how strong and how well the U.S. economy is doing. But ultimately, wasn't the whole premise behind it is that, look, if you follow an America first policy like we do, then your economy will be successful as well. Which is very difficult to do because not everyone can be the world's largest consumer, world's largest economy, uh, and dare I say it, have the firepower economically and punitively that the US can do. For instance, if you pick any medium-sized country and try to do what Mr. Trump has done by uh, putting extreme tariff stroke sanction pressure on other economies, I can't think of more than two or three economies globally that could manage to do that. Certainly the Chinese could, the Japanese, possibly the EU if it worked as a block, but there are not many other nations around the planet that could do 
as Trump does. Yeah, Trumpism, Trumponian politics, Trumponian economy, whatever way you want to put it, there aren't many nations who could do what he And dare I say it, would want mm. to do as well. A direct assault, I would suggest, a, a, a muscular a bilateralism approach, a direct ass assault on multilateralism. Well, which is obviously a, a complete contrast with the, the sort of language that you traditionally would have heard in the World Economic Forum, a place that's supposed to be a place that fosters cooperation, promotes that multilateral framework. But to your point, and you're saying, you know, there aren't actually many countries or blocks that he can go after me. We're here in Europe, and one of the big themes for Europe ongoing, one of the concerns for this year, oh, yes. is that he is might be turning his sights to Europe. And actually in the interview with Joe, he was talking about that. He addressed that specific question and said, look, tariffs are always a possibility. And, and that's the major risk here because mm. he's evaluating the, uh, the trading relationship between the two. He'll look at the deficit between the two sides and the tool, the easiest tool that he has to hand is tariffs. Well, and that's exactly, away, that's, that, that's, that's the example you know, that he's picked up from China and mm. the China model. By applying subsequent round of tariffs, eventually they got, they got China to the negotiating table, which is probably the approach that they're going to try to use with Europe as well. Well, there aren't many places he can go after in the same scale. I mean, he has a, a deal with Mexico and Canada now. He has a deal with Japan. He has the first of what would be two or three deals with the Chinese as well. Uh, naturally, if he is going to use economic firepower on another block, it's only the EU left. And that is why so many European businessmen uh, and women are absolutely shuddering at the prospect. That said, the fact that Europe, and I'll quote the President, say that the Europeans will do a deal because they, they have to do a deal. Well, maybe some European politicians uh, won't see it in quite the same perspective as well. And I was talking yesterday to Angel Guria, mm. who perhaps represents the most multilateral organization on the planet, i.e. the OECD. Uh, and and, and he, look, he completely rejects the bilateral approach, no doubt about it. Well, and of course there the big focus has been on digital taxes. That's another thorn uh, in uh, the U.S. side as well, not just uh, the automaker's policy, but of course the proposal put forward by France, the French, none other, on uh, these digital taxation of some of the big tech companies. And obviously with obviously with disproportionately targets some I mean, of the U.S. names. Almost quite farcical, I would suggest, the fact that we now have another détente on that front as well. Uh, I, I'm sure you'll recall my coverage from the summer, uh, August down in Biarritz, mm -hmm. where, again, uh, Monsieur Le Maire, who we'll be speaking to on CNBC here this week as well, and, and Mr. Mnuchin, who Jeff will be speaking to quite eminently, um, almost had another uh, detente where they said, oh, well, we can uh, agree to on this one and make some... But they have made no progress on it. The mayor wants to have a tax per uh, big digital companies, not US digital companies, big digital mm. companies across Europe as well. Um, and yet, yet again this week, it appears that any uh, rapprochement they've had has just kicked the ball into the long grass. So mm. very well, interesting. Well, you've also got to think as well, you know, about kicking the ball into the long grass. This is a very big year in the US. There is an election coming up. Um, perhaps Which is the what the last speech was thing, about yesterday. Which, well, probably, yes. Um, you know, the, many people are saying that. Uh, but, but, but ultimately, does he want to open up another trading war front at this very sensitive time for the global economy? Probably not. But then it does raise a big question what, about what happens if President Trump is re-elected and 2021 onwards. How does that redefine global relationships and the re reworking of the global relationships that have already started since the Trump I, I, administration I think, um, came into power? I think he probably would want to open that front up. I think one thing we haven't mentioned is the domestic travails that the president's having on impeachment. Um, that is one of the key issues for him. So if he can have an external enemy and change the focus, of course, uh, that is a tried and tested uh, route for many politicians. We just want to uh, say to our viewers, though, that we are having a chat about Mr. Trump, but we've got an amazing panel coming up in the next uh, couple of minutes or so. Jeff is on a uh, future finance panel. He is moderating that panel uh, in a uh, couple of moments' time. And just to say on that, all of these big issues mm. will undoubtedly come to the fore. Floor, uh, the floor. Uh, Axel Weber, the chairman of UBS, and of course you spoke to his CEO, Mr. Amotti, in the last 24 hours. He is on the panel, and he's very forthright in his concerns about negative race as well. Uh, Gorgieva, the head of yep. the IMF, and the incoming head of the IMF, taken over from Madame Lagarde, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, she will be on the panel, so a whole host of these multilateral issues uh, will be raised as well. Sajid Javid, yeah. I mean, uh, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, has promised to open the fiscal tap, so I think that's quite extraordinary as well. And the aforementioned Stephen Mnuchin, as well, the U.S. Uh, Treasury Secretary. So, a fascinating it's, cast. It's interesting, the conversations that I've had uh, the last couple of days, and I'm sure you, Jeff, Karen, as well, um, 
Most people here seem relatively optimistic about the outlook this year because they do see that the taunt happening. They do think that the signing, the so-called signing of this phase one deal between U.S. and China, at least for the time being, removes some elements of uncertainty. If uncertainty creeps back into the equation again, then you know, financial markets here really will have to have a day of reckoning look, look, look because there's right. a lot of complacency out there. Many people are optimistic. Rewind back 12 months ago. And the outlook wasn't as positive as, as it seems to be right now. Mm, I, I think you make some very valid points. I think the market valuations have gone to uh, record levels, not on only in the U.S., but also on this side of the Atlantic as well. Big concerns about, um, I can just hear Jeff in my ear sorting his, uh, his preamble on the speech as well. But we'll come to him in a few moments' time when he introduces his panel as well. But uh, as you say, valuations are extremely high at the moment. Debt levels around the globe are at record levels as well. And if things were as good as people say, then why do we have the Chinese cutting the triple R? Why do we have uh, negative interest rates still pervading at central banks? Why do we have the money being pumped into the repo market uh, in the last few months or so? So there's a few questions. If things are as good as people say that they are, then we are still in crisis measures in terms of the amount of QE in the system and negative rates as well. The big question is, is are we organically good or are we artificially good? And, and, And artificially as in... Are all of these markets being propped up by the abundance of liquidity well, out there, the abundance of, of monetary accommodation? Look at the Fed last year. Mm. Exactly 12 months ago, we were on the heels of that December hike. Markets were completely rattled by it. A few months later, back in July, they started cutting, and then they ended up cutting three times, and all of a sudden, financial markets were okay with it. So it does tell you the huge role that central banks still have to play in this environment in keeping the... the, the uh, and I just spoke ticking. to the uh, head of the Swiss Banks Association, uh, Herbert Shay who is also the chairman of Fontabelle, and he said to me he believes that 10% of U- European companies would not be in existence if indeed we didn't have negative rates propping up zombie wow. institutions. So quite extraordinary there. Right, we've talked long enough, and as you can see on the left-hand side of your screen, Jeff is uh, getting ready now to introduce his panel. I'd say Axel Weber, uh, Mrs. Gorgieva, Sajid Javid, and Stephen Mnuchin, all sitting down with Jeff on the future of finance. So a very warm welcome, everybody, to this CNBC television event. We have a large audience in the room, as well as our panelists, and of course you, our global audience, and you are all very welcome here to our discussion on the future of financial markets. Let me introduce our panelists to you and set the tone for the next hour. IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gorgieva joins us. Very nice to have you with us here Great at this to be event. With you. Just as the IMF, of course, suggests that we might see a little bit of weaker growth for full year 2020, we will discuss that. U.S. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin, who joins us fresh from a breakfast with the president. Good morning to you, and thank, thank you. you for joining Great us. And I, I guess it's idle sort of speculation, but it may be important. Was it a continental breakfast, an American breakfast, <laughs> or an English breakfast? We're, we're going to call it an American breakfast for a lot of reasons. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that... Yes. English is the best. We haven't even got to you, Sajid Javid. So we'll, you, you just hold your fire. We'll be there in just a moment. Uh, UBS chairman of the board, Axel Weber, joins us. A particular insight, of course, as we all know, into the actions of central banks as a former central banker. Um, thank you so much for being with us you. on the panel. And let's talk about UK Chancellor Sajid Javid, who you've already heard from. Some reports that he wasn't going to make the panel because he was already headed down the mountain. Uh, We're pleased that those reports were untrue. We're also pleased that he managed to bust Boris's ban from being here in Davos. So you are very welcome. Thank you Thank you very much for coming and drinking champagne with the billionaires (laughs) here at the, uh, the World Economic Forum. Uh, So, so let's kick off our conversation here. Um, Secretary, if I could just start with you, because you've just come out of a, an important breakfast, and I think there are a lot of issues on the table for financial markets that we'd like answers to. It's taken 22 months to get a phase one agreement with the People's Republic of China. We now have a deal. Is it possible to conclude phase two before the U.S. elections take place? 
Well, let me first say it's it's great to be back in Davos, and it's great to have the president here really talking about what, what is the, the great economic performance of the U.S. economy and the great outlook that we have. Uh, the China deal, we couldn't be more pleased. Uh, this week we, we signed the phase one agreement. It is a very significant agreement, including issues on forced technology, transfer, agricultural structural issues, financial services, currencies, purchases. And we also concluded the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement. So this was a great week for trade agreements. Um, as it relates to phase two, I would say uh, there's, no, there's no deadlines. So the first issue we're very focused on the next 30 days is implementing phase one. There's also, as part of this, a real implementation office uh, as part of enforcement. And we'll start on phase two. If we get that done before the election, great. If it takes longer, that's fine. So 22 months is not a, a relevant number in terms of targets and agendas. I think we dealt with a lot of the important issues in, in phase one and, and, and things that we've, we've never dealt with before. And I think that gives us a great advance into phase two. But whether we get it done or not, I just think the, the combination of phase one and the combination of the USMCA, and I know we're very much looking forward to a new trade agreement with the UK, that's a big priority of ours for this year. Um, I was pleased to see that you said you'd do us in Europe at the same time. I was a little disappointed. I thought we'd go first. <laughs> they may be a little harder to deal with than we are anyway. But a uh, lot, lot of good things for 2020. And can you clarify for our audience just the position on tariffs? Because it appears that you are reluctant at this stage to relieve pressure on the Chinese with regard to tariffs. So tariffs continue up to a phase two agreement and beyond? There's no question that the president's tariffs have been a big incentive in all these trade agreements. So whether you like tariffs or you don't like tariffs, we wouldn't have these trade agreements without either actual tariffs or the threats of tariffs. The president has said if we get all of phase two done, he will remove the tariffs. We could easily have phase 2A, 2B, 2C. It doesn't need to be a big bang, and we'll take tariffs along the, off along the way. So they're, they're a big incentive uh, for the Chinese to continue to negotiate to conclude various additional parts of the agreement. Managing Director, the consequence of this uh, disagreement have been a reduction um, of over 11% worth of bilateral trade between the United States and China. But as we know, it's also had an impact on stalling global trade in some areas as well. How do you feel about the possibility or risk for the global economy that we have another decline in those trade relationships because they're negotiating? The two big boys in the room are fighting and the rest of the world takes the pain. It is uh, very good that uh, there is now truth and a pathway to peace. And it has been reflected in how the outlook for the world economy is presented today vis-a-vis -vis a couple of months ago. We are in a better place for three reasons. One is the signing of phase one, which has reduced by 0.3% what would have been a cost on the world economy. Two, and two is very important, the fact that central banks have been pursuing accommodative policy in a synchronized manner. We had 49 central banks cutting interest rates 71 times, and the result is half a percentage point boost to global growth for last year, and for this year, for 2020. So last year, we ended up with 2.9% growth, would have been less than 2.5, which by the judgment of the IMF means recession. So we have avoided that. Uh, of course, central banks, many of them are running out of space, not the US, but many others are in a tougher place. That has helped. And three, what we see is finally bottoming out in trade and industrial output. Now, you started by saying the IMF is not so rosy about next year. Uh, this year, next year, true, we have reduced our forecast from 
3.4% to 3.3%, but it is only because of India, the main reason for downgrade, and because of unrest in a couple of countries. The rest of the world looks better today than it did uh, in October. Let me come back to the central banks, because I think uh, we can spend a bit more time on that topic. But I just want to finish where we are on the trade story here. You have said in the past mm. that the effects of this trade dispute could last a generation. There could be broken supply chain impacts yes. going forward and a reshuffling of the way the world does its business. You seem to be edging back from that a little bit now. Is well, that because we are making progress? I think, I think uh, we do have a piece of good news. And um, as the Secretary said, uh, there is already initiation of phase two. I had uh, a meeting with um, Vice Premier Liu He, who tells me in a very determined manner that China is engaging uh, on the implementation of phase one very seriously and, and on phase two very seriously. So this is a piece of good news. As I said, trade truce is not the same as trade peace. Trade peace is what we should be aiming for. We do have a better outlook on trade, and it is demonstrably uh, in the numbers of trade finally bottoming out. Let's remember, last year was a very sad year for trade. Uh, trade growth was 1.4%. Lower than, than economic, uh, but economic growth is uh, very unusual. Now we are seeing trade picking, picking up. Uh, is that good enough? Obviously not. Uh, if our projections for global growth are meager, because 3.3% this year, 34 next year, this is anemic uh, growth. Part of it because, is because these issues are not uh, totally sorted out. Uh, we will be continuing to advocate for unleashing the power of trade because historically we know trade is good for growth, it is good for jobs, and it is good for the the low-income people in all countries. You have um, characterized the risk as one of creating a digital Berlin Wall. That's something coming from your background. Um, yeah. Secretary Mnuchin, do you recognize that as a potential outcome if you and the Chinese are unable to find a meeting of minds on issues like Huawei and IP theft and the future for the Internet? Um, no, I, I discard that. So, I mean, let me be clear. You know, words like trade, peace, trade, war, things like that, those to me are not the right words, in all due respect. To me, it's about free, fair, and balanced trade. So what the U.S. is one of the largest trading markets in the world. Uh, if we can get free and fair and balanced trade with China and our other partners, this is good for us, good for them. It's one of the single biggest opportunities for American workers, for American companies. There's a huge growing middle class in China, 400 million people. It'll be good for them and good for us. So what we're trying to do is break down barriers to trade, which do exist. And I think most people know the U.S. is the most open market for trade, the most open market for investment. We want to have those same opportunities around the world. And again, we look forward to very much with the U.K., I think uh, two big markets for goods and services. We're, we're looking forward to tremendous growth uh, in, in, with the U.K. and the U.S. So it, it's not a Berlin Wall at all. It's we want other people to take down the Berlin Walls. I'll come back to you in just a moment, Managing Director. I know we're short of time, so I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, Chancellor, if I could bring you in. Um, obviously, uh, we've just heard from the President uh, directly. My, my colleague, Joe Kernan, has just interviewed him, and he said, quote, uh, the UK trade deal, we've already started negotiating. Can the UK actually si sign a deal and sew up a deal ahead of settling the ledger with the EU? 
Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me on your panel. But we are passionate believers in free trade. We, the UK has been for a long time. And I uh, agree very much with what Kristalina just said about you know, more free trade around the world is uh, uh, good for everyone, but especially for those on lower incomes. And we see more free trade as a way to lower consumer prices and get more growth and more jobs in the UK and those countries we partner with as well. And, and in terms of our sort of next steps on free trade, uh, of course, one of the, the, the big ones is uh, with our European friends and partners, uh, getting that new comprehensive you know, free trade agreement where the principles have been agreed, but there's still a lot of work to be done, and that's off to a good start. But also uh, with the US, as, as the Secretary has said, uh, the, the, the work, uh, we've already started uh, work, and we are working uh, uh, you know, closely together, but that is a huge priority uh, for us as well. I mean, having a free trade agreement between the you know, sixth largest economy in the world and the largest economy in the world is going to benefit you know, all our consumers in terms of jobs, prices. It's hugely important. Uh, so the timing was the question. Can it be done before you settle the account with the EU? I, I just spoke with the, the vice president of Spain who tells me that she met you recently and uh, you talked optimistically about your time frame. Uh, most uh, senior politicians in the EU seem to think that you're living on another planet when it comes to getting a comprehensive deal wrapped up before the end of the year. Could you take that question and well, also in terms address of trade, our, our the first, issue? Our first priority is, of course, the getting the agreement with the EU, because as we now leave, we'll be leaving in nine days you know, with a deal, but of course still to do the trade agreement. And we have, yes, we've set a timetable. It's the end of this year, but it can absolutely be done. And I've had a number of discussions myself with my European colleagues, a number of them yesterday, uh, for example, and there is a strong belief on both sides it can be done. Both sides recognize, of course, uh, that it's a tight timetable. A lot needs to be uh, put together uh, in the time that we have, uh, but it, it can be done, and it can be done for both goods, where we want to see you know, free trade with zero tariffs, zero quotas, uh, but also on services. Um, Axel Weber, could you give us a business perspective here? Um, how well received was phase one by the banking and the financial community? What impact already are you seeing in terms of the unleashing of animal spirits to take advantage of a Trump bump or a Boris bump, as it's so been right. described? Well, I think phase one deal was a welcome break for the market. It's not a breakthrough because phase two is going to be more important. So in a way, what, you, what we look at is basically what has been the impact of what is in the pipeline. And we expect a bit of an air pocket for U.S. growth in the first half of the year, largely because if you look at September tariffed imports, they're down 30 percent. Uh, there is a fading stimulus from, you know, the very welcome tax policies that we've seen uh, implemented by the Trump administration. The Fed has reacted to the disconnect between the policymakers and the market, so to say, and adjusted to what the markets have expected. Uh, the Fed's on standby rather than on hold, which is a subtle but important difference. And so the central banks have been coming to the rescue uh, almost over every of the past downturns, including some financial market corrections where the central banks were nervous about financial stability issues, but actually there wasn't a real threat for the underlying economy. So where do we stand? I think this really, uh, the whole trade universe is being renegotiated. And for me, what is important is that we don't lose the benefits of uh, fair trade around the globe, that if we dial back global exchange of goods and services, you know, which was a major force behind the, really the, the surge of growth over the last 10, 20 years, we're going to see some headwinds that will be more structural and long term. So I think everyone is knowledgeable of that. In terms of the agreement EU uh, versus European Union, look, it's hardly a surprise after three years that the UK is leaving. This is not an issue where time is helpful. Actually, time pressure is helpful. And so I think keeping the time pressure on to get a deal is going to be important. In, in the autumn, you, you talked about there being an investor strike because of the combined issues of trade and Brexit. Is that strike over? I think for the UK, there's a lot of expectation that now the new government has the majority it needs, so whatever it negotiates in Brussels, it can get done at home, which was a big concern before. Direction is also clear in that 
you know, markets always suffer and uh, have a hard time when direction is unclear and people are taking directional bets. This is much clearer. This is gradual. And I think the UK will get a new agreement with the European Union, but it's not going to be a status quo preserving agreement. It's a phase out agreement. And for phase out, you know, one option is to phase it out in stages. And that's a likely option that you're going to take. You not move everything to the new world on the same point in time. And so I'm very optimistic that because it's in the interest of both parties to come to a conclusion like it was for the US deal, that we will see a deal done. It might not really tick all the boxes for everyone, but it's largely reassured the market. And some of the investor strike for the UK, in my view, where people waited for the ultimate resolution, we're seeing that disappear. We're seeing investment being made in the UK. People are coming off the sideline. People are putting money at work again. And actually, that's going to be very good for the UK economy. Chancellor, briefly. I'm just going to add to that. We've seen a huge boost in investor confidence in the last few weeks because of the UK election result. And that result meant a removal of what you might call a double whammy of risk. There was the risk of a, a effectively a Marxist agenda for government. That was the proposal from uh, the Labour Party in the UK, probably the most anti-business sort of manifesto for government that's been seen in modern times. Mm -hmm. And that would have been a disaster for the British economy and disaster for working people in the UK. And mm -hmm. that has been removed and, and that's been uh, a welcome boost for business. But, but, but also I... the certainty around uh, Brexit, no, the knowledge that with our majority, mm -hmm. the biggest majority since Tony Blair's time, it means this political stability, which means it can stability. So the decisions we make on Brexit, that we uh, the uh, negotiations we do with our European friends, they can be certain that they will put into European law quickly. But you've you've said that Brexit won't be a boost for all businesses. Some businesses may not benefit. You've said that, and also the alignment of uh, regulations and rules that the UK seems to insist on departing from. You've also implied that not everybody will benefit from that. So it's not a universal win, is it? For British well, well, what I've said is that you know, Brexit will be a change. You know, we've had this relationship with the EU, you know, a lot, lot of economic integration for over 40 years. And of course, as we leave, there's bound to be change. But we've also been clear that there's no point in leaving the EU and then sticking with all its rules and regulations forever. We're leaving the EU, which means we're leaving its single market, we're leaving its customs union. That does mean we will not be a rule taker. But at the same time, it's really important that, uh, that it's understood that we are and will be one of the most pro-business governments the UK has ever seen, a, a government that believes passionately in the importance of business to generate the wealth that we need to pay for public services. That means low taxes, your sensible regulation, free trade agreements, not just with the UK, but with the US and many others. And that's going to be, in the long term, that will be a major boost to the UK economy. Secretary, if I can bring you back in here, uh, one area I think where there is some disagreement, and let's see how um, this gets resolved. 22 months to do a trade deal with the Chinese, a conversation between President Trump and President Macron to get a volte face on the French introduction of a digital tax. The UK says it's going to plow ahead with its own plan in April. Can they get a trade deal with you if they insist on introducing a digital tax in April? We'll, uh, we'll, we'll be having some private conversations about that <laughs> that we don't need to have on, on TV. No, please do. Please but, do. Uh, we'll, 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 we've, I've made some comments on this already, and uh, we'll be having some private conversations. And I'm sure the president and Boris will be speaking on it as well. Uh, as the president did with, uh, with Macron. But, but this is a principled issue for you and for the American government, it seems. You just don't want foreign governments and countries imposing taxes on your digital industry willy-nilly. No, that's, well, will, the willy-nilly is the important part. I think we've been pretty clear that we think that the digital tax is discriminatory in nature. There's an OECD process that we're participating in. International tax issues are very complicated. They take long times to look at. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if people want to just arbitrarily put taxes on, uh, on our digital companies, we'll consider arbitrarily putting taxes on car companies. So I take away from that that if the tax is imposed in April, UK industry can expect some reciprocal tariffs. Is that a fair assessment? I, 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 we're we're going to have some private conversations. I'm sure this will be worked out, if not at but, our but, level, between the Prime Minister and the President, who have an excellent relationship. But there's a so, very clear threat there, given what you just said about the European auto industry. Uh, again, I'm, 
want to just be clear. I think this is a important issue that we'll deal with. But going back to, let me just say the more important stuff. Let's not get sidetracked on. Well, this is important uh, on, for the markets. They will be worried. I, I, I don't think the markets are worried about this. I think the markets are are very focused on two gigantic trade deals that the U.S. just did. Mm-hmm. Again, I think phase one is very, very important to the U.S. and to China. I think the USMCA is very important. And, and again, getting this trading relationship with the UK will be fabulous for us and for them. And, uh, you know, we've, we're, we're, we will also be having trade conversations with the EU. Those started yesterday in, in a bilat. That's going to be a focus of this year as well. So there's, there's still a lot to do on the trade front. And by the way, I think, I think we're going to see on the US economy very positive impacts of this in, in 2020. Just for a moment, it's always interesting to bring in our Davos audience here. So let me just do this for a moment. Um, If I could just, I think you're all very well aware of the issues on the table. If I could just get a hand vote on a universal digital tax, does the room think it is a good idea for many of these American technology companies to pay a digital tax? Please put your hand up if you agree with that premise. Okay, um, I would that's say that's a minority about a fifth. of the room. I agree. Uh, to be clear, I agree. I was worried that you stacked the room, but I think that was a very fair vote. I, the super majority of people agree with us. I, I think you've got them worried. They, all this talk about taking people away for a little conversation in other places has got them a bit nervous. Put your hand up then if you don't think it's a good idea to see the imposition of this tax. Let's see how this one goes. I'm watching. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think you may have just carried it just slightly, but I wouldn't say there was a majority in the room for one way or the other. Um, Managing Director, let me come back to you on this because you have um, really put a stake in the ground on this issue of taxes being paid properly Mm. in the appropriate circumstances. Share with us your view here. Is it ultimately necessary for there to be a digital tax universally rolled out with the support and the involvement of the OECD. Before I get there, just to say to the secretary that this is what happens when you have a woman on a panel. We talk about peace. Uh, Now to, to, to go to your tax to, to, your, to the tax issue. Uh, I, um, I agree with the Secretary that there is a process on the way that is an encouraging process on the question of uh, a digital tax. And it is, uh, I think, much better for businesses to have predictability that what is going to be in place is going to be respected uh, by everybody. Uh, we do believe that... Um, Well, we're just going to uh, take a moment out of Jeff's panel to recap on some of the quite extraordinary lines we've already heard. We've heard, of course, from Steve Mnuchin, uh, the U.S. Treasury Secretary. Uh, He was very relaxed to start off with on the timing of a phase two deal. Uh, In answer to Jeff's questioning, he was saying, look, we could get a deal done before the U.S. election. We can get a deal done uh, post the U.S. election. We are not uh, troubled by a time frame dominated uh, by the presidential election election in the United States. Uh, He said there are a lot of good things to look forward to in 2020. He referred to the Mexico-Canada agreement uh, and, of course, prospects potentially uh, for talks leading to a UK deal. On the prospect of a UK deal, the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer Uh, Sajid Javid was asked, uh, could deals happen concurrently? And yes, uh, the U.S. is very keen on starting negotiations uh, with the U.S., uh, but said, obviously, the priority is to seal a deal with the EU first. Uh, And very interestingly, listen to Gordiova, who was saying also a trade truce is not a trade peace as well. But with that, we are now going to leave programming for the moment and go to Squawbox, which begins right now. The global elite are here in Davos for the annual gathering of the World Economic Forum. Today, Joe Kernan's interview with President Trump about the economy, the stock market, and matters important to your money. It's Wednesday, January 22nd, and this special four-hour edition of Squawk Box begins right now. Take 
take the helm and ignite your spirit of adventure with a Sunsail holiday. Relax on a skippered yacht from sunny St. Lucia to the nutmeg-scented shores of Grenada. Or take charge with a bareboat charter along Dubrovnik's glittering coastline. With up to 20% off selected destinations, now is the time to book your Sunsail adventure. Sunsail. See the world differently. Netflix shares are rising after the streaming giant added more overseas subscribers than expected in the latest quarter. But U.S. subscriber growth fell short of analyst expectations as Netflix was hurt by more competition. See that stock up by about 1.8%. Also, take a look at shares of IBM. They're also getting a boost this morning after the tech giant beat the street both on the top and the bottom lines. Notably, revenue, which rose by which rose in the fourth quarter, helped its helped by its cloud computing business. This is IBM's first revenue increase in six quarters. CEO Jenny Rometty is going to be joining us live this morning at 8.30 Eastern time. And Xerox is reportedly getting ready to nominate as many as 11 directors to HP Inc.'s board. This come as Xerox looks to advance its $33.5 billion takeover deal for the company. The Wall Street Journal says that Xerox has acquired a small stake in the PC maker in recent weeks. HP has rejected Xerox's offer, arguing that it significantly undervalues the company. And I did ask the president about a wide range uh, of topics this morning. Out of that interview, uh, the, the topics ranged all the way from the coronavirus and fears of a pandemic uh, to trade, uh, to Elon Musk's management of Tesla. And here's our conversation. It's great to see you. Thank you Thank for you. joining us again in Davos. We've done this before. That's right. I think it was a couple of years ago. Before we get started, um, with, with we're going to talk about the economy, a lot of other things. A, uh, the CDC... Uh, has identified a case of coronavirus uh, in Washington State, the Wuhan strain of this. Um, if you remember SARS, that affected GDP, travel-related effects. Um, do you have you been briefed by the CDC? I have. Are the words about a pandemic at this point? No, we're not at all, and uh, we're we have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China, and we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine. Okay, and President Xi, um, there's just some some talk in China that that maybe the transparency isn't everything that it's it's going to be. Do you trust that we're going to know everything we need to know from China? I do, I do. I have a great relationship with President Xi. We just signed probably the biggest deal ever made yes. in terms. It certainly has the potential to be the biggest deal ever made, and uh, it was a very interesting period of time. Yeah, well, let's get but into we that. got it done, and uh, no, I do. I think uh, the relationship is very. Very good. Let's talk about Davos, because you were here two years ago. Uh, even the New York Times, at this point, your favorite, acknowledges that the Davos elite are accepting that your policies are working and the U.S. economy is the envy of the world. In fact, the press coverage here is very favorable. You know what's going on back in uh, back at home. It's all impeachment all the time. Did you watch any of it? Were you, I did. I did. I watched what did you make of it night, yesterday? I got, and I had a busy day yesterday, as you know. You were there. And we had the speech, and we had lots of meetings with different leaders, including Pakistan and others, other countries, in addition to businessmen all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did get to see some of it. It's a hoax. It's a total hoax. How it do you think a perfect team conversation. I think the team was really good. And uh, the facts are all on our side. Uh, the Republican Party has never been this unified. You saw that 195 to nothing, I guess right. twice. In fact, we got three Democrats voting for us. Uh, that was with the House. Do you I think, think there'll be witnesses, Mr. President? Or do, I, do you have a I really don't know. Uh, I think that uh, if everybody tells the truth, it's perfect. But all you have to do is read the transcript. Read, if you take a look at the transcript, and it's really two transcripts. It's, uh, you know, I had a first call, which was perfect, and I had a second call, which was perfect. Do you notice they don't mention the calls, though? They never mention the calls. They talk about everything but the calls. All they have to do is read the transcripts. I put it out all the time. The other thing is, Speak to the president of Ukraine. He's been great, I have to tell you. And his foreign minister's been great. Right. They well, constantly say there was no pressure. They don't even know what we're doing. They think it's crazy. So they got the money. Uh, in fact, they got it very early. Uh, president Obama gave them nothing. He gave them pillows and sheets and things like that. And I gave them tank busters. Now, uh, it's, a, it's a disgraceful hoax. Well, we, but we do it. We had a four-hour show, four show yesterday. Yeah. Didn't, I don't even think the I word came up. Our, yeah. all, all, well, what the CEOs well, no, you are you asked me the question. No, I know I did. I know I did. I know I did. I'm saying, but I know. And I needed to ask it. And I needed to ask. That's why I did. But I really want to talk about what we're seeing over here. We came to Davos expecting to hear 
about this ESG, environmental, social, and governmental issues. We expect to hear about stakeholders versus shareholders. Right. We expected to hear about climate change. In four hours yesterday with, with the CEO of Bank of America and Schwartzman at Blackstone, all we talked about and all they wanted to talk about was the strength of the U.S. economy. It's the envy of the world. And I think if you have a strong economy, all these ancillary issues become easier to deal with. And I think even the Europeans, even the, the plutocrats of Davos are now acknowledging that. Well, I appreciate that very much. We do. We have an incredible economy. The consumer has never been so rich. They, you know, they're between the tax cuts and the regulation cuts. People forget about regulation. I think it might have been more important than the tax cuts. But we have a, uh, a consumer in the United States that has never done so well. Uh, and I think we're really poised to have, I think we have tremendous potential. You know, we're at a point where we've done so well. I think we're going to do much better. We have tremendous potential. So the market's up 50%, and we've talked about this before. November 9th is the right, date right. that you Thank need you. to do it, not, not the inauguration. I just want to ask you, because we're starting to see this bandied about that, uh, the, the, the re-expansion of the Fed's balance sheet somehow correlates with the move in the stock market. Yeah. Do you think there's anything to that, that, that they, they've primed the pump and some of the gains are, are not warranted by the underlying Well, economy? I think it's the opposite, actually. The Fed raised too fast interest. Uh, they brought up the rate too fast, and they didn't drop it fast enough. And that was very, you know, that was a lot of increases, and it was a lot of increase. And I think it's really the opposite of what you're saying. Now they've dropped it, but it was very late. And you look at other countries where they actually have negative interest rates, negative in a positive way. I mean, they're actually getting paid. They make a loan well, and they end up getting paid. It. You don't, are you hoping that it comes to that in the United States, that we get to negative rates? Because it, it, a lot of people don't think it's a great thing and it hasn't worked well in other places. Do you? Well, they don't know yet. It's so new. I want to know who are the people that buy. Okay, who are the people that buy? And they invest in Germany and end up getting, you know, less money at the period of time. So I, I have to find these people. But, but no, if Germany, and we're the most prime in the world, we're the leader in the world, we have the dollar, and the dollar is very strong. A lot, of, a lot of things are happening. But, you know, we're paying higher interest than other countries because of the Fed. Is, if we were paying less... I would do it, and I'd pay off a lot of debt. Right. I'd do a lot of things. Is Chairman Powell out of the doghouse? Is he, are rates where they should be? Are you satisfied with, with well, his Well, I don't recent? want to talk doghouse. I wish he didn't raise the rates. That was not what I thought would happen. Are we at a happen. good level now, do you feel? I think the rate should go down. It should go down further. No, because I think the dollar is very, very strong, and I think the rate should go down. Uh, we have a very strong dollar, and that sounds good, and it is good in many ways, but it's very bad in terms of manufacturing. I've created almost 700,000 manufacturing jobs. The past administration said manufacturing is dead, which I said, tell me about that. How do you, you can't do that. And we have had a tremendous success, but it's harder with a strong dollar. And uh, I want this dollar to be strong. I want it to be so powerful. I want it to be great. But if you lower the interest rates... And one of the things I do want to do is pay off debt. And we're poised for tremendous growth. It'll really kick in toward the end of this year, okay. but we're poised we'll, for tremendous growth. Let me ask you about that. We, we came close to 3% last year. This year, lower, but we, we've had, obviously, the, the uh, China trade war, which has been... We had many things. We did. Do, you, do you attribute the, the, the GDP at 2% to uh, the Fed being uh, tight for too long? Or do you acknowledge that maybe some of the tariffs or some of the, the uh, uncertainty engendered by the China trade war affected GDP? Well, it'll be higher than 2%. A lot of people are very thrilled with that. Me, I'm not, but we had a lot of bad things happen. Number one, the Fed was not good, okay. as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and that was a big blip that should not have taken place. It should not have happened, but it's one of those things. But we have Boeing. We yes. had the big strike with General Motors. We had things happen that are very unusual to happen. Could including some unbelievably powerful storms. You know, we were hit sure. with storms. Now, with all of that, had we not done the big raise on interest, I think we would have been close to four. And I, I could see 5,000 to 10,000 points more on the Dow. But that was a killer when they raised the rate. It was just a big mistake. And they admit to it. They admit to it. I was right. I don't want to be right, but I was right. There, there are some that say that the uncertainty for CEOs 
in dealing with China and making plans for the future may have hurt capital spending. Do you expect it to come back now that we've had a phase one uh, agreement? And, and let's talk about phase two if we get a chance. Okay. And, and I think the, the biggest thing about getting the deal with China, number one, it's a great deal for us. It's an important deal for China because they were, you know, their supply chains were breaking. It was, you know, it's been tough for them. The best thing that happened is we have two countries that like each other again because it was getting pretty nasty. And, you know, they have taken advantage of our country for 30 years, and we I was not going to let it happen. And uh, we've taken in billions and billions of dollars. The tariffs are still on, so I still have that negotiating chip. I have 25% tariffs on, and that's a great negotiating chip. And, yes, we're starting phase two very soon. But the relationship that we have now with China is probably better than it's ever been. The relationship I have with President Xi president for life okay it's not bad but the relationship i have with president she is is you know i think extraordinary considering he's for china i'm for us right. but uh the deal is a phenomenal deal we will take in 250 billion dollars they're going to be buying 250 billion and it could go a lot higher than that and, and real ip uh, progress made with with the ip oh, theft yeah. and, and, oh, yeah. and enforcement and, and watching and, and the tariffs stay on you, I know I was watching you, and you were really surprised that so many of these other things, the intellectual property, so many of these other things were, I read the same were part of the, the deal. The, I, no, no. I heard this was just going to be uh, ag buys. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is and manufacturing, this is uh, technology, this mm -hmm. phase one is a massive deal. And in the end, it's probably $250 billion, but it could go much higher than that. And just that alone, not even talking about the USMCA, which now we just got passed. In fact, yes. when I go back, I'll be signing it. It's all passed. And we had, I believe, 89 votes in the Senate, which is tremendous. Is the UK next with Boris Johnson? Yeah, Boris and I are friends, and he wants to make a deal, and that's okay with me. So that I think could they start, want it. They need it. That could start soon? Oh, yeah, we're starting. We've already started negotiating. And... Frankly, we're starting with Europe, too. Europe is, to be honest with you, Europe has been very, very tough to deal with. They've taken advantage of our country, the European Union, for many, many years. And I told them, we can't do it anymore. I met with them yesterday. I wanted to wait till they finished China, to be honest with you. I always like to be very transparent. I wanted to wait till I finished China. I didn't want to go with China and Europe at the same time. Now China's done, and I met with the new head of the European Commission, who's terrific. Mm -hmm. And we had a great talk, but I said, look, if we don't get something, I'm going to have to take action, and the action will be a very high tariffs on their cars and other things that come into our country. Now, saying that, I don't want your audience to get nervous. They're going to make a deal because they have to. They have to. They have no choice. But we've had a tremendous deficit for many, many years, over $150 billion with Europe. And they are, frankly, Jean-Claude was a friend of mine, but he was impossible to deal with. And I think it's going to be a lot better for Boris now, too. You couldn't make a deal. It was very hard to make a deal. Now, I never played my cards because I didn't want to do that again while I was doing China. I wanted to do China first. I wanted to do Mexico and Canada first. But now they're all done. And now what we do is we are going to do Europe. And I had a very good conversation. And I would be very surprised if I had to implement the tariffs. We had... Um we had one of your guys, the NEC uh, director, uh, Lawrence Cudlow, on yesterday. We asked him about deficits, and we asked him, um, I mean, I, I, we acknowledge that you wanted to rebuild the defense industry, and you had to agree had to issues. certain things with, with the Democrats. In right. the second term, will you look Big at... focus. Will you look at... And, and we, do you need to raise taxes, or do you need to cut spending? We're going to actually probably lower taxes, if you want to know the truth. You know, if you take a look at what we've done, we've cut taxes in half. And we've taken in more revenue substantially than we did when the taxes were high. Nobody can even believe it. But we take in more revenue with the big tax cut. I mean, you were paying really 41 percent that we brought it down to 21, and it's sort of lower so, than that. So that will be a priority. Oh, uh, absolutely. For and taxes. one of the reasons I'd like to see the interest rates lowered, frankly, is because I'd like to refinance the debt and pay off the debt. Uh -huh. And we're going to have tremendous growth. Joe, when you have all of these trade deals that I've made, don't forget, I made a $40 billion deal with Japan. I made a massive deal with South Korea. Nobody even knows what the number is, but, you know, it's a horrible deal now. It's a great deal. And then you add Mexico, you add China, you add Canada, you add all of these other countries. And we have about 10 countries that we're dealing with. These deals were horrible. In many yeah. cases, we didn't even have a deal. They just came in here and took advantage of our country. So uh, we have massive potential, massive growth. 
and you'll see that toward the middle to the end of next right, year. I'm going to go through like 10 things. Yeah. Cause if there is a second term, do you have a, a, a preference for an opponent? Uh, I came up with the three Bs, Biden, Bernie, and Bloomberg. All very different. Yeah, Vinnie Mike is spending a lot of money. It's got no chance. Uh, but he's got a tremendous, uh, you know, he used to be a friend of mine until I ran for politics. And then... Uh, he went a little off. You should see some of the nice things he said about me before I ran, or like the nicest. But he had to deal with Hillary Clinton that he was going to become Secretary of State. It was very simple. People know that. And it wasn't going to happen. It was going to go to Terry McAuliffe. I mean, so they were playing with Michael. And uh, it's too bad, but he's spending a fortune. He's making a lot of broadcasters wealthy, and he's getting nowhere. His ratings are terrible. His, uh, you look at his numbers. Uh, I don't know if Joe's going to limp across the line, but you, you, I watch him. I watch him speaking. He can't put together a sentence, but it could be him, and it could be Crazy Bernie. I don't know who it's going to be. Whoever it is, I'm ready. I just want to ask you some rapid-fire questions, just just to get your your comments. So, so Boeing uh, yesterday the news, and it hit the Dow yeah, yesterday, and the news is is the summer perhaps before. Yeah. We see Very disappointing reason. company. Uh, this is one of the great companies of the world, let's say, as of a year ago, and then all of a sudden things happened. I am so disappointed about it. It had a tremendous impact. You know, when you talk about growth, it's so big that some people say it's more than a half a point of GDP. So Boeing, uh, big, big disappointment to me. Big disappointment. Yeah. Apple, what do you think? Your, your friend, uh, I, I think am. I like them a lot. Percent. I yeah. think so, we should do some... Encryption. I think we should uh, we should start finding some of the bad people out there that we can do with Apple. I think it's very important. Frankly, I've helped them a lot. Uh, I've given them waivers because I want them. It's a great company, but it made a big difference. And, you know, they compete against Samsung, mostly Samsung. I guess that would be their number one competitor. That's from South Korea. It's not fair because we have a trade deal with South Korea, so Samsung would get the no waiver, and they would, they would have to pay uh, tariffs. So I did waivers, but I want them to help us a little bit. They, you know, Apple has to help us, and I'm very strong on it. Uh, they have the keys to so many criminals and criminal minds, and we can do things. When they had the problem with the uh, recently in Florida, I won't go into it because it's so horrible. Right. But they could have given us that information. It would have been very helpful. Well, we don't need a backdoor uh, way in getting into the wrong hands either. I mean, you, you, do you, no, no, do I you, understand. You know what? I understand both sides of the argument. And this one, if you're this dealing with drug lords, with, with if you're dealing with drug lords, yeah. if you're dealing with terrorists, and if you're dealing with murderers, I don't care. We have to get. Okay. We have to find out what's going on. Can uh, Facebook? Is it, is it, Zuckerberg well, I met him and he told me that I'm number one in the world in Facebook. He sat down. He said, congratulations, you're number one. Now, I wouldn't be able to say that. Should he stick to his guns with the political end? He's getting a lot of fun. I'd, I'd rather have him just do whatever he's going to do. You know, yeah. he's, done a, he's done a hell of a job when you think of it. And uh, he's going to do what he has to do. I heard he was going to run for president. That wouldn't be too frightening, I don't think. But he does have that monster behind him. Uh, but he said, you're number one. And I said, that's very nice. It's always nice to be number one. Uh... You know who number two is? Tell me. Modi of India. Yeah. But he has 1.5 billion people. I have 350. So, uh, Modi. And we're going there very soon. All right, too. last but not least. And just... by the way, our relationship with India, no. and again with China, and with Japan, and with so many countries, is better than it's ever been. Literally better than it's ever been. Tesla's now worth more than GM and Ford. Do you have comments on Elon Musk? Well, you have to give him credit. I spoke to him very recently, and he's also doing the rockets. He likes rockets, and uh, he does good at rockets, too, by the way. I never saw where the engines come down with no wings, no anything, and they're landing. I said, I've never seen that before. And I was worried about him because he's one of our great geniuses, and we have to protect our genius. You know, we have to protect Thomas Edison, and we have to protect all of these people that... Uh, came up with originally the light bulb and uh, the wheel and all of these things and he's one of our very smart people and we want to we want to cherish those people that's very important but he's done a very good job uh shocking how well you know how it's come so fast i mean you go back a year and they were talking about the end of the company and now all of a sudden they're talking about these great things he's going to be building a very big plant in the united states he has to because we help him so he has to help us do I dare? One last question. Go ahead. Entitlements ever be on your plane? 
Uh, at some point, they will be. We have tremendous growth. We're going to have tremendous growth this next year. It'll be toward the end of the year. The growth is going to be incredible. And at the right time, we will take a look at that. You know, that's actually the easiest of all things, if you look, because it's such if a you're big you're willing percentage. to do some of the things that you said you wouldn't do in the past, though, in terms of Medicare. Well, we're going to look. We also have uh, assets that we never had. I mean, we never had growth like this. We never had a consumer that was taken in through the different means over $10,000 a family. We never had the kind of... Uh, the kind of things that we have. Look, our country is the hottest in the world. We have the hottest economy in the world. Uh, we have the best unemployment numbers we've ever had. African-American, Asian-American, uh, Hispanics are doing so incredibly, best they've ever done. Uh, black, best they've ever done. African-American, the numbers are incredible, the poverty numbers, the unemployment and the employment. There's, there is a difference, actually. But the unemployment and employment numbers for African-Americans are the best we've ever had. You know, we just uh, came up with a chart, and it was a very important number to me. African-American youth has the highest by far unemployment, the best unemployment numbers that they've ever had, and the best employment numbers. Right now, we have almost 160 million people working in the United States, and we've never even been close to that, Joe. All right. Safe travels uh, on you. your way back. Thank you once again for, for you. meeting with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Great, Joe. doesn't sleep this man I, I don't I, I know that he was at dinner last night with some CEOs and I had lunch with CEOs uh, as well yesterday and I know I saw had a breakfast this morning had a breakfast this morning Tim Cook and some others I but your interview was before the breakfast right yes yeah. but there were tweets throughout the night too now I'm not sure they're all yeah, I don't know how that works you think the pre-programmed no I, I, I he does have a someone that helps him with social media I'm right. sure I wish I did I feel like uh, I know which tweets are his Maybe you do. Part. <laughs> Maybe you do. But uh, uh, I think he does. You know, there was quite a few tweets last night, but I'm not sure he gets a lot of sleep a lot of times. You but. covered a lot of ground with him today in this interview. I, I, I think it's kind of remarkable. I was trying to keep track of the different topics as you were going through it. But uh, let's just focus on some of the business issues. But I got a lot done in seven minutes. Uh, I think it was a little longer than seven minutes. It's 22. Uh, <laughs> it was a little seven. longer than seven. Yeah. Um, look, the economy and so many things, we've heard about some of those issues from him. But very interesting where you talked to him about Chairman Powell. Is he out of the doghouse yet? Um, yeah. Because he keeps circling back to that issue as he did yesterday again in his speech. It's cute. He didn't like the word doghouse. That's yeah. like, that's like, that's, that's tame compared to what he uses on some of these issues. Right. That, and I thought the really interesting point about CapEx spending, are we going to see a resurgence now that you've seen the, the phase one trade deal that's been signed by this too? And, and that's kind of what everybody is waiting to see at this point too. And, um, did you hear that? I don't know if you saw that part, Andrew. He goes, yeah, I was listening to you, and you thought that it was only going to be ag buys. I got that from you. You told me that, and then I got in trouble for it because there was some IP and in, in, in other... The other. focus at the time was on the ag buys. That is true. I, and I, I, I don't said, think I, I was responsible I read this, for that. No, you weren't. I said... No, I don't, I don't listen to it. No, but... You don't listen to me right. anyway. But, so. I did on Tuesday... Yes. Uh, and and it, not on camera, we talked about that article. He's, he, yeah. he's happy. Oh, he, here, here's the key, though, is what happens. Will they uh, stick to the plan with what they've said? The president told you that he, he'd be very surprised if, they ha if he had to actually implement the tariffs. He does think the Chinese will uh, be, be true to their word and stick through with some of the promises they made in that phase one deal. I wanted to get deeper into... That was pushing it. I was at 20 minutes then. But, but entitlements, because I said in the past... You've ruled out means testing. You've ruled out doing anything to Medicare. And, and he goes, no, it, it would be easy to do some of those things. So, But that, that might be something you'd But when you it. asked him about cutting entitlements or cutting spending, he said, right. actually, we're going to lower taxes. That's what he plans to do if he has a second term. And, and when I said in a second term, I didn't mean in, we all know it's going to be a second term. I said, if you did have a second term, mm -hmm. I mean, I was watching that. I'm like, oh, God. I, I can see it. I see the Twitter, the Twitterati coming in on me. You know, assuming it's a. But if he did, I, I'm not sure what you would do if you don't raise taxes, though, in terms of spending. I don't know where you cut spending mm -hmm. to the extent where you'd get it below a trillion dollars or whatever. A lot of fodder in that 22 minutes. Much more that we're going to be talking about throughout the morning. Uh, in fact, when we come back, veteran financial journalist and closely followed Fed watcher Greg Ip will join us with his reaction to Joe's interview with President Trump. Again, lots of businesses he talked about, Facebook, Apple, Boeing, and we'll talk about all of that coming up in just a little bit. And then later this hour, we will kick off a parade of CEO newsmakers. Our special guests include BP boss Bob Dudley and Sanofi chief Paul Hudson. 
Stay tuned. You are watching a very special edition of Squawk Box. We're live from Davos, Switzerland. We'll have more of Joe's interview with President Trump coming up in just a little bit. Hi, Phil Swift here. People. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. 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 Mix it up. Skip. Run. Skip. Run. Give yourself a lift. Mix, mix it up. Lift. Mix it up. Run. Lift. Splash. Skip. Lift. Run. It's crunch time. Skip. Mix, mix it up. Run. Mix it up. Add a boxing class. Skip. Run. Splash. Skip. Run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing until March. T's and C's apply. Run. Mix, mix it up. Skip. Run. Right, I've got the phone bill here. Lucy's school friends, three hours. Dan, five gig on mobile games. And who was on the phone to my brother until 3 a.m.? Mm, Nigel, I think we need to talk. Get control of your finances. Don't miss the Sun's money saving series. Five tip filled pullouts to help you manage your money. Pick up the Sun today. Keys. Check. Phone. Check. 70s playlist downloaded. Check. Nice. There's one more thing you should check before you leave. Your travel. There's a new cycleway under construction between Kensington Olympia and Brentford Town Centre, so expect delays due to lane closures at the junction of Kewbridge Road and Cheswick High Road. Plan ahead at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. On a TUI tour, our English-speaking local guides will take you off the tourist trail. They won't just help you find the perfect souvenir they'll show you how to make it. Choose from over 70 unforgettable tours worldwide. From tranquil temples in India to sunrise safaris in South Africa. On a TUI tour, we cross the T's, dot the I's, and put you in the middle. Book now and enjoy up to £200 off per booking. Booking T's and C's and minimum spend applies. Selected holidays only. At all protected. Smart Sports Wagering Talk is now on TuneIn. This is Brett Musburger. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Search B-E-T-R. Be better informed. Be better prepared. And remember, cash and tickets is what it's all about. Coming up when we return, President Trump speaking out on the economy, the Fed. And uh, hear what he told Joe earlier this morning. All straight ahead, ahead live from Davos. And then later this morning, you want to miss our lineup of corporate power players. We've got a huge lineup, including the CEOs of Uber, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, IBM, and (laughs) Coca-Cola. Stay tuned. You're watching a special edition of Squawk Box, live from Davos, Switzerland. This is not a commercial. This is a reminder. With TuneIn Premium, you could be listening to more music commercial-free. Get over 45 commercial-free music stations. Visit TuneIn.com slash premium to upgrade. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. On this week's On the Media, we peel away the many layers of the Warren Sanders sexism sideshow. The first layer is, can we acknowledge that in a country that has only elected male presidents throughout its history, that gender is a factor? Also, depressed by politics? We have a plan for that. Listen to On the Media from WNYC. Listen to the On the Media podcast on TuneIn Today. A lot of people aren't aware that TuneIn lets you listen to the same terrestrial stations that you pick up on your FM AM dial. Except you can hear them from anywhere. To see all the stations broadcasting in your area, find the local radio section on the home screen. Keep it local with TuneIn. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open three, DeAndre Hunter got it! Hand off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in, touchdown. From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is, it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Fans, the 
2019-20 NHL season is here. And it tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. You can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Catch your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3 is up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. Had we not done the big raise on interest, I think we would have been close to four. And I, I could see 5,000 to 10,000 points more on the Dow. But that was a killer when they raised the rate. It was just a big mistake. And they admit to it. They admit to it. I was right. I don't want to be right, but I was right. That's, uh, yeah, we know that. That was President Trump uh, speaking with me earlier this morning. may not know me. You probably know him. Uh, for more on the president's take on the economy, we're joined by Greg Ipp, Wall Street uh, Journal chief economics commentator. And uh, you probably saw a lot of the interview, but, but what stands out to you is, is the comments about, about European um, trade and, and conflict and the, the potential for, for a new front to open. Right. I think that if you want to know what the key policy risk to markets uh, is this year it was exactly what he said to you, Joe. He said, I didn't want to take on China and the European Union at the same time. China's out of the way. He's basically cleared the decks. He's being very confrontational with the Europeans. So if you want to be on the lookout for risks, watch the rhetoric, watch the threats that now come between the EU and the United States. That said, I believe that there's a bit of bluster here because a trade war with the European Union is a completely different animal from a trade war with China. We export three times as much to the Europeans as we do to China, and the Europeans are very, very adamant that they retaliate dollar for dollar. They will not fold in any sense the way China, if you want to say it. He, he, he picked sides long ago in the in the Brexit EU battle, though, and once again, he, he you know, throwing some uh, compliments to Boris Johnson and the potential for a, a, a near-term deal with the UK. So maybe it's not surprising to then say, but it looks the other way with the, with the EU. What we've learned, I think, especially from USMCA, is that talking about getting a new deal and actually doing a new deal, very different things. Look at how many years it's taken us to get this far on a new NAFTA, and the changes from the old NAFTA are relatively minor. Well, look how, although, look although how pessimistic we were. in a different we position, needing to have some trade deals yeah. if they are, in fact, leaving the European Union, right? Uh, exactly. So with respect to Britain, uh, the United States is very much in a driver's seat. But remember, when it comes to the European Union doing a deal, the president is very conscious about not having a bad economy going into the election. Mm -hmm. And if we are in a trade war with our one of our largest trading partners, and again, this is a trading relationship much larger than with China, that is not conducive well, we, to a Can't we learn from what happened with the USM? Do you remember we were hurtling towards a no deal? And it, what Christopher Freelander was saying, I mean, it was acrimonious between Canada. It was acrimonious between Mexico, we were down to the wire. There were days left. Suddenly, everyone came together and we got a deal. Don't, and that's the way. Th I mean, we can we can look at that and think we might see something similar again, don't? don't Joe, you? I've been watching trade negotiations for twenty years now. They all go exactly like that. The very first U.S. Canada free trade deal, uh, you know, came down to like minutes before the deadline. So there's that. Number two, the reason it came down to the deal is that both sides really wanted it. The Canadians retaliated, okay? And Charles Grassley said to Trump, "If you do not pass this deal, uh, if you do not take the tariffs off Canada's steel, you're not getting this." Deal. So there are constituents in the inside the United States who are basically circumscribing the president's latitude here. So again, translate this to the European Union situation. What is the blowback going to be like from American companies, American exporters, American governors, if he starts uh, taking, uh, starting a trade war with the European well, Union? Well, let's just look at what happened with French President Macron earlier this week. It seems like the two sides kind of reached uh, some sort of a deal and a recognition that they didn't want to really start ramping things up. Should we read that? as a blueprint for maybe how the rest of this goes, too. It's all about leverage and what matters more to you, all right? The, the, Trump, I think, correctly said, we threatened them with very steep tariffs as they went ahead with this digital tax. Mm -hmm. The fact of the matter is the digital tax was not in any sense existential or really critical to what the French wanted to do. So it was... You know, it was a symbolic, the tax was symbolic, and caving on it was kind of symbolic. But if the, if, if the president wants access to European agricultural markets, that is more than symbolic. That is something that is is not going to trigger an easy uh, cave-in. Uh, with you, we'd normally be talking about the Fed and Powell. He didn't want to engage on Powell. 
You know, I thought I heard what he said. He didn't want, didn't want to talk about dog houses. Yes. So I guess if you're Jay Powell, it's kind of an improvement. You know? Like, I mean, maybe he's in the servants' quarters now. And after another good year of the stock market, maybe he'll move up to the in-law suite. Oh, so yeah. let's face it, the president's unhappiness with the Fed is inversely correlated with the stock market. The Fed did turn around last year. We've had a very good stock market. And I think that if it stays that way, and I think odds are it is, we have a very friendly Fed, biased, more likely to cut than to raise rates this year. Uh, is probably going to be relatively calm on that. Let me ask but. you a political question. If the president wins another term and Powell's term is up, is it clear to you what happens? I think it's very unlikely he reappoints Powell, given what he has said. I think the big question is then who does uh, who takes his place. Now, there's a lot of debate. Kevin Warsh, by the way, was at the at the White House just last week. I think he would clearly be in the running. I think Rich Clare, the current vice chairman, would clearly be in the running. He would be very acceptable to the markets, ought to be acceptable to the president, given that he has such a dovish take on the things that matter to the president, you know, like the dollar, like about foreign interest. We have a better so chance on. of Jeff Sessions being AG again than Powell being reappointed. But I don't know anything. What? His term is six-year term? I don't think Jeff Sessions is coming no, but it, back. It's six-year term? So, six-year term? Four-year term. Four-year term. 20, Four-year term. So he would yeah. bump yeah, right so he would after. Bump right it, yeah. And then all of a sudden there'd be a big question about who's that next person. Right. And what would they actually do? So there are two tests that that person has to pass. They have to pass the Trump test and they have to pass the Senate test. So as you know, Judy and Shelton is a Larry Kudlow favorite. He, she's uh, now being sent up to be nominated to the Board of Governors. Right. But she has, let's say, somewhat heterodox views on monetary policy. You know, a very strong uh, fondness for the gold standard. I think that's going to be an issue for uh, some senators, Republican senators, possibly... They can let it go for a board seat on the Board of Governors. I think for a chairman's spot, that's something where they're going to apply a much tighter screen. Greg, thanks. All right, thanks. All right, see you. When we come back, BP CEO Bob Dudley will join us live. We're going to talk about oil prices, the global economy, and much more. Stick around. We'll be right back. Still to come on Squawk Box, the CEO of Sanofi on innovation and healthcare, rising costs, and the new flu like coronavirus. Meeting people is my life. Boredom, fitness enemy number one. So don't just run, run, run. Mix it up, skip, run, skip. Run, give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run. It's crunch time, skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up, add a boxing class, skip, run, splash, skip, run. Mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster. Join now for 12 months and pay nothing until March. T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip, mix it up, run, mix it, mix it up. Keys. Check. Phone. Check. 70s playlist downloaded. Check. Nice. There's one more thing you should check before you leave. Your travel. There's a new cycleway under construction between Kensington Olympia and Brentford Town Centre, so expect delays due to lane closures at the junction of Kewbridge Road and Chiswick High Road. Plan ahead at tfl.gov.uk. To the Mayor of London and TfL. Every journey matters. Got big plans for 2020? Capture and share every highlight on a gorgeous iPhone 11 with an ultra-wide camera. In Tesco Mobile's big January sale, you can get the latest iPhone for £40.75 a month with double data. That's a mighty 20 gigs. Go in store or search Tesco Mobile. Tesco Mobile. Every little helps. Ends 26th of January. Was 10 gigs, now 20 gigs. 36-month credit and rolling monthly usage agreements with Tesco Mobile required. Subject to status, phase policy applies. See tescomobile.com slash terms. New year calling for a new kitchen. Get to B&Q for up to five years interest-free credit with no deposit on our new kitchen range. Hurry, offer ends 2nd of February. You can do it when you B&Q it. Minimum spend £8,500 for five years interest-free credit. Credit subject to status. B&Q PLC is a credit broker and works exclusively with the Tarchi Capital UK PLC, both authorised and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority. Chilly January days in London are tough enough without a broken boiler. Keep your home warm and working this winter with two years interest-free credit and your boiler installed by one of our expert engineers. Plus, you'll get a five-year British gas warranty. And we can even quote by video call after work or on weekends. Get a quote by the 29th of February and you can also get £200 off a new boiler or £400 off for our existing home care customers. Search British Gas New Boiler. Conditions apply. 
Welcome back, everybody. We have more from our newsmaking interview of the morning. Joe sitting down with President Trump right here in Davos. They touched on trade relationships with China, Mexico, Canada, and Europe, among many other topics. We've had a tremendous deficit for many, many years, over $150 billion with Europe. And they are, frankly, Jean-Claude was a friend of mine, but he was impossible to deal with. And I think it's going to be a lot better for Boris now, too. You couldn't make a deal. It was very hard to make a deal. Now, I never played my cards because I didn't want to do that again while I was doing China. I wanted to do China first. I wanted to do Mexico and Canada first. But now they're all done. And now what we do is we are going to do Europe. And I had a very good conversation. And I would be very surprised if I had to implement the tariffs. Joining us right now to react to this and much more, let's welcome BP CEO Bob Dudley. And Bob, it's great to see you this morning. Great. Thank you, Becky. Uh, you heard what the president had to say. We were just talking with Greg Ipp about how now that China and the United States seem to have some of their issues resolved, uh, it kind of puts um, Europe in the crosshairs. What, uh, what do you well, think about that as somebody coming from, from Europe? Well, I think it gives uh, the U.S. and Europe now time because, yeah. like, like you said, the focus was on China and North America before that. So I think the, the door sounds wide open for the U.K. to talk to Britain. And uh, yesterday the European president said all efforts in Britain or in the U EU to get a deal done with Britain by the end of the year. So this seems to be moving fast. Things have moved a lot fast since December. Well, let's talk about your, your tenure at BP and your time, because you only have a couple of weeks left before you're stepping down as, the C as CEO. It's been almost 10 years. Um, That's right. yeah. it, it, it's been a tumultuous time. You were there, and at the very beginning of your tenure, you had to deal with the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And then in the middle of your tenure, you had to deal with a historic drop in oil prices, going from over $100 a barrel down to $30 a barrel. Um, what do you think caused all of those issues in terms of oil prices? And do you think the same issues are going to be there for the next day, decade when it comes to big oil? Well, I think in terms of oil prices, the, the fact that the U.S. is now the largest oil producer has created a dampening effect on oil prices. So I don't think the volatility will happen like it has happened in, in decades before. It's, it is quite a game changer for the U.S. to be such a big energy producer. So I don't think that will happen again. There will always be volatility. Um, and I think uh, the OPEC, OPEC Plus, plays a little bit of a dampener as well on this. And uh, I think the oil markets are sort of healthy, good for consumers and good for producers as well. It's in that range where the pain isn't too great on either side. And, of course, oil going forward, lots of question marks about it and peak oil as well. So we're in the beginning of a – we're already well into but an accelerating energy transition as well. But the U.S. is quite well positioned in terms of all forms of energy going forward. Curious, as the leader of a fossil fuel company, what you made of Larry Fink's letter last week? Received his letter. I, I think it's, you know, this energy transition is moving really fast. And any energy company who doesn't pay attention and start moving really fast, many of us are, I think, um, will be uh, in danger of being completely off with society. Got to remain economic, but uh, uh, I spoke with Larry yesterday. He came to the IBC meetings here, explained it. It's not a get out of uh, hydrocarbons. Right. He made that clear. Well, that's just ludicrous. Uh, well, that's right. The world does need a lot of hydrocarbons going forward. It needs all forms of energy. The world needs less emissions but more energy. It's going to take all kinds. Mm -hmm. Do you think? Did you you saw also what Microsoft did last week? Yes. Do you think that's you're going to start seeing that from big companies with big balance sheets that can afford to do that? Because I assume, by the way, if you're a smaller company, you probably can't. I think that's right. Things like carbon capture storage uh, do require deep pockets. Uh, the energy companies, oil and gas companies, the big ones are all working hard on this. And I hope the companies like Microsoft, the tech companies, sort of join forces on this so we can develop the technologies together, invest together. That's um, a very politic way of putting things. I think you've been a little more outspoken recently about your frustration with some of the climate change people, some of the ESG people, in terms of what the realities are and how long you think fossil fuels are going to be around here. Well, that, that is right. I mean, we'll have two billion more people on the planet. We'll need a third more energy by 2040. It's the equivalent of the United States and China entering you know the demand who's system. You know take the brunt into that is the developing world, too. I mean, it's just, I mean, we, we take heat and all these great things. We have air conditioning, food, Food, shelter, clean water, we take it all for granted. You know what I mean? It, it, let's, we'll see what happens. I, I, mm. And you can't be outspoken. I'm not outspoken anymore. Nobody can be outspoken because of, I mean, they use terms, they use religious terms like denier, like heretic. Like but what, but what, where are you really? 
where he can't tell you where he is. Can you tell, no, can you tell? Do you feel like you can't no see where can. you really are? Sometimes you can't. It's such a simplified world. The backlash is quite quite strong. Uh, the reality well, is, it's well, probably seventeen year old views. dropouts. Well, you have, you, I would say, a Northern European view, uh, East Coast, West Coast view in the United States is very different as you spend time like I do in places like India and, and uh, Indonesia and, and, and Africa. There's just two different views on this. And, and, you know, some people don't have enough electricity to keep the refrigerator running in the village for some medicine. No clean water. No clean water. They've got to walk f for four yeah. hours to and from to get some clean water for their family. No pipes, no toilets. I'll tell you a story, uh, just something that fascinated me. It was in India in December. Uh, the energy minister told me he had, most people cook food with wood, cow dung, coal. He put liquefied petroleum grass in the houses. 60 million people subsidized, saved five hours a day for people who cook the food, mostly women, changed what they can do, jobs and educating. I mean, those are the stories that you don't hear very much about that are, give me hope. I'm optimistic. You know, 20, 20 years ago, None of us had these phones. Right. Think about how that's changed life. Right. Same thing will happen with energy and efficiency. Growth, prosperity, money for governments to use to fight things like this and deal with things like this is, is important. And, and, and economic um, sustainability is important as well. It needs yeah. to go hand in hand. They don't talk about in Davos ever nuclear energy. I know. Which well, they really should. That's also... I mean, I know it's controversial, but it seems to me know. that's... It's it, the same kind it, of... It, it is the fix, at least the fix that's available right now. Nobody wants to... I mean, what are the chances that AOC and Bernie are going to be right about all this? And what are the chances... Are they right about anything else? What are the chances they're going to be right about this, Bob? I think they have a completely unrealistic idea of the complexity of the global energy system. Right. It's very complex. You know, 3 to 4% of the world's energy demand is renewables today. It needs to grow like crazy. <laughs> And what about will. the economics? I'm so worried about the science, because the, they're not the scientists, right? You you look into the science a lot, do you? I read the science. Huh? I read you? the science. I'm who's not a scientist. Your, who's your favorite? Do you, do you have a single climate have, change? I, can you I name know, one? I know Judith Curry. True. I know that. Roy Spencer. I don't, I don't have John, a. Chris I don't have a favorite. No. Okay. Michael Mann. He's a great director. But we Love must you. reduce carbon emissions. We must do it. Okay, so... And a point about if, it. <laughs> if the guy who runs the company is saying you must reduce... You them. think an oil executive can, can say we don't need to reduce... Do you the genuinely carbon? believe that? Coming up. Yes, I do. You yes, genuinely... Do. Why? Absolutely. Because why? Well, carbon, for example... Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Two centuries of economic history tell us if you don't put a price on something, you won't change people's behavior. Well, why would you want to change the behavior yeah, if you don't put that for you? I... I do believe you do it's bad. Okay. Well, it's price low, it's point zero four percent. It's been higher in the past. We're exhaling a hundred times that amount right now. Anyway, Bob, thank you. Thank you, Bob. You're gonna have a lot more time up, on your hands, so come back again. Coming up, Santa Fe okay. CEO Paul Hudson and drug innovation, uh, and then growing fears of a spreading coronavirus. Did you know that the the common cold is a coronavirus? Yes. SARS was a coronavirus as well. And a reminder: you can watch us uh, or listen for us live on the go on the CBC app. We're coming right back. Reincarnation. Take the helm and ignite your spirit of adventure with a Sunsail holiday. Relax on a skippered yacht from sunny St. Lucia to the nutmeg-scented shores of Grenada. Or take charge with a bareboat charter along Dubrovnik's glittering coastline. With up to 20% off selected destinations, now is the time to book your Sunsail adventure. Sunsail. See the world differently. The Sky Broadband sale ends soon. Get a massive 30% off Superfast Broadband and Anytime Calls. It's now just £25 a month for 18 months. So you can stream, share, play or tweet in the living room, bedroom, hey, any room you like. It's usually £37 a month, but now it's just £25 a month for 18 months plus 1995 setup. So what are you waiting for? Offer ends 6th of Feb. Visit sky.com today. Sky Fibre Network areas speed vary by location. Prices may change during contract terms apply. Want to kit out your new kitchen for less? Get to B&Q. We've 20% off all kitchen sinks, taps and appliances when you spend £2,500 on a beautifully designed and affordable good home kitchen. Hurry, offer ends 2nd of February. You can do it when you're B&Q it. In-store orders only, maximum 10 appliances, excludes clearance, see DIY.com. Today is your day. Visualize your goals. Grab the bull of opportunity by the horns of ambition. Because there's two yous in future. Which do you want to be? Or leave the motivation to vitality. With our life insurance, you could save up to 40% on a Garmin fitness watch. 
for a little nudge to exercise a bit more. Now that's real motivation. Search Vitality Garmin. Life's better with Vitality. Variable discount. Postage and packaging terms and conditions apply. Like what you're listening to? Want to make getting back to it easier? Use the favorite button to keep track of the stations and podcasts you love on TuneIn. Just tap or click the heart icon to add it to your favorites. Then find all your go-to audio under the favorites tab. Pretty easy, right? Be better informed, be better prepared. The Better Network is on TuneIn. This is Brent Musburger. Search B-E-T-R and start hanging out with me and my guys in the desert weekday afternoons. The Better Network is now on TuneIn. Coming up live uh, on Squawk Box here in Davos, Switzerland, we got a lot to discuss with the CEO of Sanofi, including drug prices, innovation, and the spreading coronavirus. He's going to join us live with the latest. And you are watching Squawk Box live from Davos, Switzerland. What a beautiful shot that is. We're back in just a moment. Uh oh, there you go. You might already know that TuneIn allows you to listen to all the pro sports leagues wherever you go. But did you know TuneIn is also home to the wide world of college sports? Open three, DeAndre Hunter got it! And off Carruthers, big hole right side. He leaps and he surges in, touchdown! From live college football, basketball, and baseball games to podcasts and coaches shows fueling your love for the game and your school. And the best part is, it's all free. Search college sports to find your team or league. Want to hear about the latest and greatest things to listen to on TuneIn? For reminders of the biggest live sports games, debates, and breaking news stories, follow at TuneIn on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay connected with the audio that matters to you. Cutting for the net, scores! On the goal! Hockey fans, the 2019-20 NHL season is here. And tucks it home! And with this team, it's it's really fun to be a part of a team like that. And you can hear the action live on TuneIn Premium. From regular season action to the All-Star Game and through the Stanley Cup in June. Hear the home and away call for every game, for every team live. At home or on the go, never miss a game with the NHL on TuneIn Premium. Upgrade today. You love TuneIn for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. Upgrade to TuneIn Premium and get over 45 commercial free music stations. You'll also get live commercial free news plus live play by play games from NFL, MLB, NBA, and NHL. Visit tunein.com slash premium to upgrade. Pascal gobbles up the rebound and slams it down. Catch your favorite NBA team right here on TuneIn. A step back, D3 is up and in. Search NBA on TuneIn and hear all the action. The NBA lives on TuneIn. I don't feel like I want to throw up. The first confirmed U.S. case of the mysterious coronavirus rattled investors and pressured some sectors yesterday, uh, like airlines and casinos. Uh, Here's what we know about the outbreak of the potentially uh, deadly virus. It originated uh, in China. It's usually transmitted by bats. Uh, The first U.S. case was reported in Seattle, and some airports are stepping up uh, their screening of passengers. Uh, I did speak with the president about this earlier this morning, and I asked him if there are worries about a pandemic at this point. No, we're not at all, and uh, we're, we have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China, and we have it under control. It's uh, going to be just fine. Thank you. Eunice has been uh, doing some work on, on this and tweeting. I've been following everything. She said that the World Health Organization is... Uh, convening a meeting today to inform the, the director general about whether they need to, uh, to, to uh, I guess, invoke a public health emergency uh, on an inter- as an international concern. And we don't, they don't know yet. At this point, I don't know what you know, Paul Hudson, CEO of, of Sanofi, but coronaviruses, there's hundreds of them, like the common cold. The SARS, though, was a much more virulent form of the, of the coronavirus, but it, it can affect... Uh, uh, economies greatly in terms of of GDP contracting and travel and everything else. So it's something you need to keep a close eye on. Uh, That's right, of course. Whilst not an expert in this area, you know, I work for a company that uh, has a high degree of specialism in vaccines, for example. 
and we work tirelessly to try and get ahead of these things where possible. It isn't always, and it can travel quickly. Um, you know, we work a lot on influenza, for example, which can get ahead of you quite quickly too. And uh, we sprint to make sure that we can get enough doses to make sure everybody's covered yeah. every year. Eunice pointing out that some of the, uh, just the conversation in China is to make sure that that they're totally transparent because sometimes you have a tendency and maybe not if it's 440 cases and it's really a thousand you you call it for for nine deaths and instead of uh, that's what i mean yeah. so but uh at this point human to human transfer looks looks pretty rare so uh, we'll see anyway what, what's most amazing paul is is the the next five years and 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 what the drug industry is going to look like and you're at the forefront of that in terms of digital uh, innovation and and I don't think people understand it. It's it's not just in developing uh, new therapeutics, but it's also in the, in the manufacture, which is difficult of a lot of these molecules. And you need to merge the two. Yeah, I mean, the, this is I've been in the role just over a hundred days, something like that. And um, one of the best uh, reasons to take a role like this at this time is the digital disruption the nature of it, the data availability, what it can mean for discovering new medicines, what it can mean for different manufacturing practices, or for supporting uh, patients on a daily basis. You know, for example, um, we opened up a factory in Framingham, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, just a few months ago. 128, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it, the joy of it is such progress has been made on data and digital. It's almost completely self-sufficient from renewable energy. Um, we take 760 million different data points every day checking our quality, and uh, we manage wastewater, and it's all because of the tech uh, disruption, and we make tremendous progress, so it's right across the spectrum of our business. There's a lot of hope there about uh, the new development of, of, of drugs that can go after maybe rare diseases and other things. How, how is the FDA, in terms of supporting what you're doing and allowing um, these new techniques to get you to be able to produce medications more quickly, new, new, new drugs? Yeah, look, I think... I think, and I think you referenced the five years, it's, uh, it's an incredible moment for scientific innovation in general, whether it's gene therapies, uh, gene editing, uh, whatever's at the forefront. In rare diseases, there's such a huge unmet need. We spend a lot of try and time trying to help patients with Gaucher's disease, Fabre, Pompe, really debilitating life-changing disorders. We have an opportunity to collaborate with the FDA and to get into conversation early. We've been taking advantage of that, which is why we're making breakthroughs as a company uh, in hemophilia, in early breast cancer, to add that, um, in uh, multiple sclerosis. So we go above and beyond. I think it's a great time for data transparency to speed up uh, innovation. Can I ask you, you've got an out-of-the-antibiotic business, for the most part, it seems like. And it seems like there's a huge question mark about how to effectively incentivize drug companies to participate in the next R&D that's going to be needed to get to the next place yeah. on antibiotics. What do you think the answer is? And is there a way that you've thought about that would make it economically viable for you? You know, um, it's a complicated question, a decision taken uh, before I joined, of course. But more importantly, uh, we have to line up the incentives. Let me give you an example in vaccines. You know, we have to make a vaccine you know, to, to stop somebody getting infected six and seven and eight years in advance. So it's a big investment. We have to stockpile that in case of challenges, which we do. Uh, but often we're asked to get uh, much lower in terms of uh, our prices, and it's very difficult to reconcile the two things. You know, uh, I'll be working with Gavi later about trying to make sure there are access to vaccines, but we can do more, of course. Um, but I think that overall, as an organization, we're committed to what we can prevent in diseases in our vaccine business. Very good. Paul Hudson, thank you. Thank you. When we come back, we've got much more of Joe's newsmaking interview with President Trump. Plus, a big hour ahead with the CEOs of Uber and Palo Alto Networks. Stay tuned. You are watching Squawk Box live from Davos, Switzerland. Feeling sluggish or weighed down. Take the helm and ignite your spirit of adventure with a sunsail holiday. Relax on a skippered yacht from sunny St. Lucia to the nutmeg-scented shores of Grenada. Or take charge with a bareboat charter along Dubrovnik's glittering coastline. With up to 20% off selected destinations, now is the time to book your Sunsail adventure. Sunsail. See the world differently. Boredom. Fitness enemy number one. So don't just run. Run. 
run, mix it up, skip, run, skip, run, give yourself a lift, mix, mix it up, lift, mix it up, run, lift, splash, skip, lift, run, it's crunch time, skip, mix, mix it up, run, mix it up, add a boxing class, skip, run, splash, skip, run, mix it up at Virgin Active and get stronger, fitter, faster, join now for 12 months and pay nothing until March, T's and C's apply. Run, mix, mix it up, skip, mix it run, mix it, mix it. The Grand DFS Sale featuring Wallace. Uh, hello. And Gromit. Well, say hello, lad. Every sofa is made to order. Uh, by a speedy sofamatic machine. <laughs> by hand. Well, suit yourself. So you can have your sofa exactly how you want it. Made of cheese? Not that exactly. Oh, probably a good thing, eh, Gromit? It'd be gone in a jiffy. The grand DFS sale is now on. How about a cushion made of cheese? Or a footstool? Or a... At TUI, we're spreading sunshine early by giving away hundreds of thousands of free kids' places. So you can holiday with the little ones for less. Book today and spread the cost with zero pounds deposit when you pay with direct debit. From splash parks to swimming lessons. At TUI, we cross the T's, dot the I's, and put you in the middle. Direct debit on web bookings only. Free kids' places subject to limited availability. One free child place per two full paying adults. Booking T's and C's apply at all protected. Global business leaders are here in Davos for the World Economic Forum. This hour, the CEO of Uber on the company's growth, its path to profitability, and the challenges ahead. This is a special edition of Squawk Box in Davos. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Squawk Box here on CNBC. We are live from the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. I'm Becky Quick, along with Joe Kernan and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Let's take a look at what's been happening with U.S. equity futures at this hour. We've been higher, uh, above fair value, all morning long. Right now, it looks like the Dow futures still up triple digits, a gain of about 107 points if we were to open here. S&P futures indicated up by just over 11 points, and then the NASDAQ up by about 49 points. We should also uh, take a look at Treasury yields and see where the market stands right now. You're going to see that at this point, the 10-year is yielding 1.771%. The death toll from the coronavirus in China has risen to nine. Chinese health officials confirm that 440 cases of the flu-like virus exist. Another 2,200 people who came in contact with infected people have been isolated at this point. First case has also been confirmed in the gambling area of Macau. The threat of the virus hit the shares of several casino operators on Tuesday. Here in the United States, 